Hello? I will take your thing off. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming, uh, att attending to our um, workshop, multilingual learning workshop. We're happy to have you all here. Just before we get started, in case you don't know, there's uh, restrooms down the hall, um, uh, down that hall and to the left. There's uh, a lunchroom of some kind downstairs. Um, but if you do, uh, so lunchtime, if you do go get lunch, though you have to, if you're a visitor, you have to go around and go back through security and everything, but that's okay. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Zenji uh, 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 Zak. Uh, that's all right. Uh, Nakazawa. Nakazawa, thank you. Uh, who's uh, Chairman Pai's uh, public safety and uh, uh, consumer affairs advisor to kick this off. All right, hey, it looks like we have a uh, stellar crowd. Is this working? All right, yep. good. Thanks. Uh, so good morning and uh, welcome to the FCC. And on be, uh, behalf of Chairman Pai, I, um, he asked me to come here to extend his warm appreciation to each and every one of you for participating in today's very important workshop on promoting multilingual alerts. So um, emergency alerting, whether we're talking about emergency alert services, uh, uh, systems or the uh, wireless emergency alerts is a critical tool for public safety officials to keep their communities sp uh, safe, especially in times of danger. Uh, as you know, the FCC has been actively working on multiple fronts uh, to strengthen emergency alerting. Uh, for example, Chairman Pai, under Chairman Pai, the FCC has expanded the functionality and improved the geographic accuracy of wireless emergency alerts. The FCC has also acted to make the emergency alert system more reliable and to help alert originators gain proficiency in using the system and to help identify and prevent false alerts. And also, we've also coordinated with our good friends at FEMA on nationwide emergency alert tests and assessing those results and issuing our findings to address areas for improvement. And as you may know, the next uh, nationwide EAS test is scheduled for August 7th. But really, when you look at it, none of this would be possible without your participation and partnership with the FCC. Together, we're improving the reliability, the security, and I hope that's not a robocall, <laughs> accuracy of alerting. <laughs> that's my other hat. Um, we are also ensuring that alerts are relevant to affected communities, and that's really where multilingual alerting comes in. Uh, for an emergency to be effective, it needs to be widely accessible. Uh, and so that's why the commission is really committed to ensuring that emergency ar alerts are available to non-English speakers, as well as those who are deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind. But the commission can't do this alone. And that's why this workshop is so important. We're bringing together truly in my mind and in the chairman's mind, the best and the brightest here to tackle this issue head on. So let's take a quick preview of the panels. Uh, the first panel will provide a soup to nuts discussion of multilingual alert capabilities for both legacy EAS alerts, as well as uh, those alerts originating in the common alerting protocol format for distribution through FEMA's uh, integrated uh, public alert and warning system. <coughs> Uh, the second panel will look at how state and local authorities are successfully using multilingual alerting in their communities. And the third panel will discuss how technology can enable alert content and emergency information to be distributed in multiple languages. I'm really elated to be here and I'm confident that the information and experiences you share today will be helpful to all stakeholders in improving their own efforts to send and distribute alerts in multiple languages. In addition, it's my hope that the information that you share today will help inform the Commission's Intergovernmental Advisory Committee as it considers recommendations concerning multilingual alerting. Now before I lead, uh, uh, yield the floor to our distinguished panelists, um, I'd like to really give a shout out to our outstanding team in the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, um, led by the indefatigable Lisa Folks, and also um, for this workshop, um, in particular, David Munson for shepherding uh, this, this project through, despite the fact that he butchered my last name, but that's all right. <laughs> uh, and also, of course, our Office of Intergovernmental Affairs, chaired um, by Greg Cook. 
Uh, so, and with a, again, with a special thanks to our panelists. You guys have traveled a long distance to be here on a very hot, sweltering Friday, and we will make sure that you get back in time to see the U.S. play France in the soccer tournament. So, yeah. all right. Uh, so that's our goal, all right? So thank you all for participating in this workshop. Um, I so appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Zaji. I should say thank you, Zenji Nakazawa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so for our first is this thing on? You're okay. on. Uh, for our first panel, um, uh, just so you all know, uh, we'd like you all to speak for like five to seven minutes uh, about your multilingual activities, um, and then we'll ask you questions, and then we'll reserve time for the audience, 15 to 20 minutes, minutes hopefully, for uh, audience questions if there are any. Um, I guess we can um, start from um, right to left. Uh, I'll just introduce the panelists. We have Justin Kane from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, Greg Cook from the Office of Intergovernmental uh, Affairs, uh, Al Kenyon from FEMA. We've got Orlando Bermudez from uh, NOAA. Uh, we've got um, um, Andy Scott from uh, um, Cable. Cable, right. NC, I can't, uh, the name keeps changing. NCTA, Larry Walk uh, from NAB, and Matthew Gerst from CTIA. So, um, Justin, do you want to yeah, start good off? Morning. Thank you. Um, so, again, I'm, I'm the Deputy Chief of Operations and Emergency Management within the Public and Safety and Home, Homeland Security Bureau. Um, one of the great, greatest tragedies during events, uh, disasters, emergencies, or events of national security or, or public safety significance is the loss of life or, or any uh, injury that may have been caused uh, because of a lack or because of a huge language barrier. Um, and, and we've kind of been presented with this situation in the last several hurricanes when we're talking about Hurricane Michael and Hurricane Maria and Hurricane Irma, where we have large communities of foreign language speaking um, citizens and residents. And the inability to get them the information they need could be catastrophic, right? So um, being able to, to push forth um, changes in, in the way we do alerting so that those folks can get the information they need um, really helps us to do our job as first responders. And, and it kind of limits, obviously, the, uh, the mental and, and spiritual anguish that we have to undergo as first responders. Um, and and this, just do, this doesn't just account for those foreign languages, as, uh, the foreign language speakers as well. This also accounts for, for those who are deaf or hard of hearing. You know, to be able to get these messages out to the people that need it the most in a timely manner so that they can get the evacuation order or they can get the information on, on where the closest uh, rally point is to, to receive resources when they need them the most, that's incredibly important to us. Uh, so from an operational perspective, what we do ahead of time is try and identify those communities that may have that large uh, language speaking uh, group of folks, group of residents, and then we try and perform outreach as necessary to try and um, identify anyone that can assist. Naturally, we don't have all the language speaking resources we need in the commission, so a lot of that um, a, a lot of that outreach um, usually goes to our federal partners or state, local, tribal, and territorial partners uh, to be able to provide us those personnel and resources. Um, and it, it's, it, it's proven um, you know, so critical and valuable to, to this overall situation where we've managed to assist in, in the life-saving process and help other people to avoid you know, being impacted significantly by these disasters. Um, so I can't, I can't say enough how important this is. Um, you know, this is near and dear to my heart. Uh, with, with some relatives who, who speak different languages myself and, um, you know, having a lot of friends and relatives as parts of the disabled community, it's really important to be able to get this message out. And from an operational perspective, first responders, being able to get them the information they need to know where these people live, to get to them in a timely fashion and help save lives, that's incredibly important. So thank you for, for allowing me to be here today. Uh, thank you, Justin. Great. Hi. Thanks, everybody. Uh, my name is Greg Cook. I'm, I'm the chief of the Intergovernmental Affairs Office within the Commission's Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. But before that, I spent 13 years uh, doing public safety work and working very closely with uh, the emergency alert system, with the folks who initiate the alerts, with the folks who uh, design the equipment. Thank you, Harold Price, for being here today, uh, 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 that, that <coughs> receive the alerts. And, uh, and, very, and more and more with the government entities that initiate the alerts in the first place. And uh, one of the things that I'd like to start out by saying is that the, 
the, the Commission's commitment to making sure that the EAS is accessible has been consistent from day one. The Commission has consistently tried to, to keep EAS to be technologically up to date so that it can reach the most, because that it can reach the entire community that is affected, as, as, as Justin pointed out. So I'll go back to like 2003 during the HDTV transition, where we took the original EAS, which is a very simple but robust system where basically a, a pre-canned message, it's like a baked cake, you can't mess with it, is delivered to a, a, a big radio station in an area, a big 50,000 watt, and then trickles down to other radio stations that monitor this to deliver the alert to the public. It's very simple, it's very effective, it's still in place, but it has some very definite technological limits, and one of them is language, that, that this is, goes out in English, uh, the, the, the basic premise, the idea for that is that it's really for the president to communicate to the entire country in times of national emergency, war, or major natural disaster. So it's made to be the simplest thing that is possible to reach the most amount of people at the, at the, in the quickest time. And it does that. And, and that's, again, what's being tested in August to just run through that system. So we'll get to see that. But as technology has advanced, the Commission's commitment to the EAS has advanced. And I'm going back to 2003 because during the HDTV transition, there was no, uh, 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 it wasn't considered initially f to, have, to have HDTV deliver the EAS. So we worked on a rulemaking with the Commission that not only got the HDTV to deliver EAS, but, 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 but satellite radio, such as uh, you know, Sirius XM, uh, uh, digital cable, uh, uh, DBS satellites, such as uh, uh, you know, uh, DDS satellites, as well as, uh, as, as any of these other digital formats that were coming up. And by setting sort of a digital infrastructure platform for the system, it allowed the Commission to take it the next step when really the Internet began to, to develop and, 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 and folks in the public safety community developed something called the Common Alerting Protocol. It allowed a digital message to be delivered over EAS that could have files in it that wouldn't be a baked cake, that would have elements in it. So if, as we're going to see in the second panel, a particular uh, community wants to send out an alert in multiple languages, because they're serving multiple communities, they can do that. And then the TV station or the radio station at the edge, equipment can be goes, oh, I'll take the Somali version or I'll take the Spanish version and distributes that to the public. So as the, as the, as the technology has evolved, this consistent commission commitment to de delivering effective alerts to entire communities remains unchanged. Same goes through in the wireless area because with, with the wireless emergency alert system, uh, one of the primary things that the advisory committee uh, that developed the, the sort of the technical underpinnings for WEA did was how do we make this accessible? So the first thing, thinking was, well, how do we make it accessible for, for, people, uh, for, for people with disabilities? And that's, for example, for why, uh, for people who are deaf or hard of hearing um, or deaf blind, you've got the, a, a vibration cadence. So when that phone sort of buzzes in your pocket in a very particular way, you know something is happening and you can take it out and read it or listen to it. Um, this has extended to Spanish, where again, because WIA is based on common alerting protocol, which is transmitted through the uh, integrated public alert system that I know Al will talk about, it gives us the ability to create an infrastructure that allows initiators to deliver multiple languages. We're starting with Spanish, which should be you know, live at some point soon. And I think what you're going to see is that as this experiment progresses, more languages can be delivered over these platforms. Now, that brings me to the last piece, and that's really why we're here today. We can build all this cool stuff, and we've been building all this cool stuff, but it doesn't mean anything unless the initiators are involved, unless the initiators know how these things work, and are committed to developing, to taking those steps that they need to, to deliver these alerts to the public. We've learned through some of the events that have happened over the last couple of years how essential it is that uh, what, that the alert originators and their superiors, somebody in the governor's office, who might not know a heck of a lot about emergency alerts, but nonetheless runs the, the, that office of emergency planning within the state, to, to know who the players are and to know what their community's needs are. So I think what we're going to see in the second panel is how various alert initiators deliver these alerts to the public. 
there are all kinds of cool solutions. We talked about some of the high-tech stuff that we're doing in EAS and WIA. There are some very simple things that can be done that are very, very effective and can be done on the fly, and I think we'll see that in the, in the second panel. But the point of this workshop, and as Engie mentioned, the point of the Intergovernmental Advisory Committee, which I also chair or manage, uh, is that um, we really need engagement from the alert initiators. We really need them to become educated as to what their community needs are and what resources that we and the folks who are going to be hearing from on this first panel have to address those needs. So I think this is going to be a really great workshop. Thank you, Dave, and, and uh, look forward to the rest of the afternoon. Thanks, Greg. Al? I'm Al Kenyon. I'm the uh, <clears throat> Customer Support Branch Chief for the IPAWS office. That's uh, the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System. Let's squish that down to IPAWS. It makes it a little bit, little bit easier to handle. <clears throat> I deal mainly with the uh, uh, alert originators and uh, helping them to get signed up and, and to uh, uh, pr get, um, become properly configured to use iPaws. iPaws is the, the digital connection between the alert originators and wireless emergency alerts. Uh, we operate the, uh, an ag uh, a message aggregator that was referred to in, in some of the earlier committee work as the federal message aggregator. Uh, that, uh, that certifies that the messages are, are, came from a, a properly authorized individual and are suitable for processing uh, and handing off to, uh, to the carriers. Uh, we also uh, pass messages to EAS devices. Uh, as Greg said, EAS is the uh, uh, highest level priority is for, uh, for national emergencies for, for, the pre for presidential use. Therefore, EAS devices, which every broadcast uh, radio, television, cable operator has to have a, has to have an EAS device, and it has to monitor the iPod's uh, EAS message feed. Um, our, my friend over here, uh, Harold, has uh, uh, produced many, many of those devices, as it, as have several other uh, companies, and they're out there and they're regularly saying, "Is there something for me? Is there something for me?" So they're all they're all uh, actively checking to see if there's a message from uh, folks like. Uh, John Dooley over there was, 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 was taking notes. His, his uh, alert originator with uh, and an IPOS coordinator for, uh, uh, for for the for the state of Minnesota. Uh, we also have a, a county representative in here, um, and hopefully there are, there are others that are that are monitoring us. Um, IPOS early on we we worked on standards. Uh, we uh, we worked with um, Oasis which is a group that has the International Standard, uh, Standards Organization for CAP messaging. We produced a, uh, uh, a U.S. profile for CAP, for CAP messaging. And included in that profile is part of the standard is for multilingual, the first block of, of information. It's called an info block. It contains all the information that goes to EAS and to WIA. The first one is in English. And at the header of it, it says, Language and the and the response to that is en us English. If you want an additional additional uh, language blocks, you put them in there. Um, the Spanish language block would is be is en us for Espanol. Uh, if you want to put one in for uh, American Samoan, it's as us. I happen to know because I crafted an alert which we intended to send to American Samoa, but we never. We didn't quite get the fit it into our schedule. I even have the audio for it. It's pretty cool. Uh, the, capa the capability to, to deliver messages from a, an alert originator to EAS and to WIA as the standards are, de are developed and improved for uh, uh, multilingual delivery to WIA, it's there. It's built into the, into the uh, CAP message profile. Um, to assemble a message, it's uh, you need to get a, uh, a CAP authoring tool. Originally, we had a CAP authoring tool that went with uh, a system we called Demus. Uh, and uh, somewhat thankfully, we were not allowed to, uh, to offer that to the public because there were other, uh, uh, other commercial entities that produced CAP messages, and the government could not go into competition with private industry, so uh, uh, we had to withdraw our product. It was a dog. It was probably a good thing it died. Um, no offense to dogs. Uh, there are some very fine uh, 
products out there in the, in the marketplace that uh, will, will help guide an alerting authority through assembling a CAP message. There are a number of evolving products out there, so the buyer has to uh, <clears throat> examine them very carefully uh, to make sure that the uh, CAP authoring tool suits their purposes <clears throat> and has the capability to, uh, in, uh, in this case, uh, add a multilingual block. Uh, Spanish is the one that's, uh, that's been demonstrated through EAS, and Spanish is going to be available for, for WIA very shortly. Uh, other languages are, uh, IPOS is capable of ha handling multi multiple languages, like I said, multiple info blocks. Uh, we have one minor, uh, it's probably not so minor limitation at the moment. We are limited to uh, a, a, a Latin character set. So, uh, but there are workarounds for that and hopefully when we uh, do our software revision after this one and move to the cloud and get away from the uh, uh, the, the database system we're operating on now, which is our, our limiting factor for characters, uh, we'll be able to handle uh, some more elaborate characters within the limitations of what's acceptable to uh, uh, under wireless emergency alerts. That system has its own, uh, own character limitations, but that doesn't mean you cannot use them to send messages in, mul uh, in multiple languages. IPAUSE does not offer automatic translation. We don't recommend automatic translation. If uh, you're asking the public to take an action to uh, preserve life or property, you want to make sure that you have the correct message being delivered. So we encourage the development of templates. And we, we can discuss that as, as, as we go forward. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Al. Orlando? Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Orlando Bermudez. I'm from uh, the uh, San Antonio Weather Office in Texas. Uh, I've been uh, working with the Hispanic community for uh, quite some time. Um, I'm the lead program leader of MAS, um, which means Multimedia Assistant in Spanish. And this is a group that formed about two years ago. And actually, it was a regional team, and it became a national team last year. Um, since uh, 2017, with the um, hurricane season um, impacting the islands of uh, Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and then uh, part of Florida, and also the Harvey storm, um, we were basically activated and we started translating as a group. Um, the Houston office at the time didn't have any Spanish speakers, so what we did, um, the messages went uh, to the group and we translated the messages. It took us basically between two and five minutes to translate and then send over to that office so that office can send the, the messages out. So that's how we uh, take care of the uh, Hispanic population um, during that particular event. And then for last year for Michael and Florence, um, the different offices in North Carolina, they didn't have any Spanish speakers, so they activated our group and we translated uh, not only um, small messages, but also we translated um, graphics. Uh, they um, sent out the PowerPoint presentation to us and we translate the message and it goes to the social media. Um, by the way, um, we help out with the uh, we, uh, uh, new character, with the uh, 360 characters that are hopefully um, implemented here um, soon once the capability of the iPod are ready to go. But uh, our group was contacted to go ahead and translate those messages. And it's like um, Al just mentioned, the right message with the right translation, that's what we need to save life and property. So our group, um, a group of um, uh, meteorologists from NOAA uh, took those messages. Um, I think there are about 10 to 12 messages and we translated it on a way that is understandable and actually serving the mission of the uh, National Weather Service. Um, on part of the uh, different transmitters that we have out there, there is a, a one in San Diego, um, Miami has one, Brownsville has um, two, and El Paso has uh, another transmitter that um, basically takes the English version and sends it out in Spanish. However, um, the only office that has worked out the dictionary to basically 
when that message goes out and you can basically understand it is the one from Brownsville. The other ones goes automatically. Um, sometimes the message is not as clear as we want to, but at least we have something out there for the public to, to take precautions and, and pay attention to the stuff that is going on. Um, the one in San Juan, Puerto Rico, that one is in a particular, um, it, it does something different because of the way that they do things in Puerto Rico. They don't set anything out. They have a person, basically once the warning goes out, they have a person that records the English version, right after that does the Spanish version, and they have 120 seconds to put this out, and then, all, and then after that it goes to the air. So it is very different the way that Puerto Rico does the warnings, but they do go out and they do go out quickly. Um, and that's uh, one thing that I would like to see um, more improvement on the automatic thing, uh, um, setting up things for, for these different offices. Um, as of last year, there is a new software application within our system, which is um, called the um, broadcast message handler. So all the National Weather Services office, they do have this software and the capability of sending out the transmitting the uh, translating the English version into Spanish. So that capability is there, but it takes a lot of effort and time. So for now, what we're doing is we're taking advantage of our group, which is, like I said earlier, the mass team, which if you translate that into English is more. Um, and uh, so we had this group that it gets activated and we translate anything that comes in our way to make sure that we are saving life and property. So that is activated for 22, uh, for 72 hours, and we take any messages from National Weather Services, from emergency management offices that they want something translated on the spot. We take that message and we send it out <laughs> to them and other uh, federal agency that will like the help from our team. Then we also have another outreach team that takes um, uh, different projects and different documents that are longer, and we translate those two as well. So we do preparedness also in Spanish with these other groups. So uh, take note, and if you need uh, additional information in these two different teams, please let me know, because uh, that's why I'm here uh, today with the rest of the group to promote and uh, become together as a grant group to save life and property. Thank you. Thank you, Orlando. Uh, Andy? Well, thank you, David, and thank you, Jen uh, Sanjay, for, uh, for inviting me to the panel today, and uh, good morning uh, to everyone. Um, yeah, we got a whole bunch of stuff to talk about, so I'm going to keep my opening remarks uh, mercifully brief, and uh, you fellows can uh, thank me uh, for that later. <laughs> I'm Andy Scott. I'm with the uh, National Cable and Telecommunications Association. We represent the, the cable industry with respect to EIS and, of course, other, uh, other issues. Um, not surprising to anyone, probably. Uh, we think uh, the cable industry plays a key role in the dissemination of uh, a local, uh, regional, and, and national EAS messages. Uh, uh, our uh, cable operator members uh, uh, relay uh, EAS messages, uh, gosh, thousands of them every day uh, on a voluntary basis. Uh, they pass those messages on to, uh, uh, to cable customers. And they do that over some, some pretty complex video and audio uh, delivery systems uh, at this point. I know Greg and I have had uh, discussions often about just how complex cable systems uh, can be. And, and the fact is there's virtually no part of, those, uh, of that complex uh, uh, system that doesn't interact in, in some way with the EAS delivery technology in the cable system. Uh, it's a very important, a very integral part of the way we uh, deliver uh, messages uh, to, our, to our customer. And, and we take uh, great care to make sure that that EAS technology is working just right because uh, if it's not 100% reliable, uh, it affects all the channels that are, uh, that are delivered to, uh, to the customer. I guess the other thing I would note, <clears throat> excuse me, is that um, uh, EAS me uh, message delivery in a cable system is, uh, is largely done uh, unattended. Uh, there's no one sitting in our facilities with their finger over a big red button uh, ready to take action when an EAS message comes in. 
those messages uh, that come in from the alert originator are passed through automatically uh, to cable customers. So uh, the cable system is essentially a passive conduit between the alert originator on one end and the cable customer uh, on the other end. Um, uh, and so now with respect to multilingual alerts, that same approach applies. Uh, so the EAS technology that's in place today in the cable system will pass through any alert message that comes in from the alert, uh, from the alert originator, uh, just as it was designed to do. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, it's, it will not translate uh, those messages to another language. So in other words, the system relies uh, on the upstream alert originator uh, to provide the alert message in the appropriate language or languages uh, for the intended audience. Uh, so for example, if, uh, if an alert originator uh, creates an ES message or messages in say uh, English uh, or Spanish, uh, the cable system can pass that information on uh, to, uh, to the customer in those same formats. That's really it in a nutshell, and I uh, look forward to, uh, to the discussions today. <coughs> Thanks. Thank you, Andy. Larry? Thank you. Uh, my name is Larry Walk from the National Association of Broadcasters. I just wanted to thank uh, Dave and the FCC for putting together this very important panel. It's, it's, uh, it's a good issue to try to move the ball forward on, and uh, yeah, I put together a very impressive list of, myself not included, of speakers. Um, I guess I would start off by noting that we represent uh, radio and television stations across the country. Um, these broadcasters, they take uh, great pride in how they step up during emergencies and weather emergencies and natural disasters and other kinds of, other kinds of uh, emergency conditions that can arise. They are, our broadcasters live and they're part of the communities that they serve, their friends and neighbors rely on them. and. Um, they take a, a, a lot of pride in how they can uh, step up and keep the public warned and informed with uh, emergency alerts, but also ongoing information as an emergency unfolds and, and afterwards. It's really part of their DNA. Um, as far as uh, the issue of the day, you know, we've, Gre uh, Greg and, and Al alluded to um, how the EAS system works. There's, of course, still the legacy system with the uh, SAME coding language that's used. You also have the iPause program that, uh, that Al has described. Um, but regardless, whichever uh, system is used to disseminate the EAS alert to broadcasters and, and on from there, as Andy mentioned, broadcasters, we still, EAS is still a machine-operated, automated, uh, system and uh, broadcasters like cable systems are kind of passive conduits for the most part um, in that larger system. Um, for lack of a better word, it's kind of a garbage in, garbage out kind of, of process. So I think that you are on the right track with this panel in trying to figure out ways for the alert originators to have better tools, better education, and, and uh, just uh, better capabilities to originate messages in multiple languages. Um, if you're using the legacy system, it, can, it would have to be in English and, and then a subsequent, hopefully very quick, uh, foreign language uh, text message. Uh, and uh, with the uh, iPods, you know, one message can carry multiple languages. But, um, Either way, as Andy mentioned, broadcasters and their role in the EAS echo system is uh, we rely on the upstream alert originators to, uh, to send us the messages that need to be distributed, at least until, as Greg mentioned, the consumer equipment in place might be able to, uh, to do this. Uh, if a TV could automatically be set to the language that you want or cell phone or radio or, or what have you. Um, that could be an inter interesting development. Um, it would, uh, the FCC has, has looked in the past at perhaps putting the, uh, putting the onus on broadcasters or cable systems to somehow translate uh, messages, and I think they came to the right conclusion that it would just not be an efficient way to go about it. There could be uh, problems with accuracy if it has to be translated at the broadcaster level. There could be problems with 
timeliness of getting the message in and out quickly enough, uniformity. So um, the best place, at least so far, is to you know have it start at the translators at one central spot and then disseminate out from there. Um, and we can talk about that more later. So, so I'm encouraged that uh, emergency man local emergency managers might be able to uh, learn from learn some new information today, learn some new tools that they can use. Um, I think that there's an opportunity there for them to take a look at their policies and their operations. Uh, perhaps, if they haven't done so already, figure out what kind of communities and different languages they need to uh, get these EAS messages, messages out in. Um, and the last thing I would note is just I don't just to preview the second panel on a non EAS issue is uh, emergency programming and content, um, which of course the FCC doesn't really have a, a role in regulating, but um, I know that uh, some of the speakers on the next panel will talk about how broadcasters, for example, work together during emergencies, and they have voluntary arrangements to make sure that emergency information and content and instructions and uh, escape route information, what have you, where to get clothing and food, um, all of that gets out in the languages that the communities need. And um, they work together either to, an English station might run PSAs to promote, you know, go to that other Spanish language station if you want information in Spanish or, or what have you. So um, I just wanted to highlight that those kind of arrangements are going on and happening and uh, and I look forward to hearing more about that in the second panel. Yeah. Thank you, Larry. Matt. Thanks. I'm Matt Gerst. I'm with CTIA. Um, we represent the uh, wireless providers who are voluntarily participating in the wireless emergency alert system and a number of the handset manufacturers who build the um, cool, great devices that I think everybody probably has in their pocket today. And you know we're very um, proud of the wireless emergency alert system. It's only been around since 2012, but its impact has been pretty significant. Um, we pr receive all kinds of messages during the day, pop-ups that come up on our phone. But if you receive a WIA, you know it, and it's probably the most important message you're going to receive. Um, it's one tool in the toolbox in the overall emergency alert portfolio that's available to local alert originators. Um, so we have broadcast services, you have other opt-in messaging services, but um, from our perspective, wireless emergency alerts are the most potent emergency notification tool that the local alert originators have at their disposal. And that's the case for two reasons. One is um, consumers are served by, or 99% of consumers are served by a wireless provider who is participating in WIA. So almost any, anyone in the country um, is served by a wireless provider who can support the WIA message being uh, broadcast out. The second is that most people probably have a WIA-capable phone in their pocket. WIA has been built into wireless devices that have been sold since 2012. And as we know with handset turnover and how people buy new devices every couple of years, in the last seven years, probably most people have received a wireless emergency alert-capable wireless device. So wireless carriers haven't, um, and the wireless industry has been very supportive of the wireless emergency alert system, even since it was initially designed and built. Um, there are a number of enhancements that have been built into the um, WIA system since 2012, and even ongoing right to this day. So let me talk a little bit about those things. But I think one common thing you'll hear from Andy and Larry and I, and I, and I think we heard from the rest of the panel, is that all the emergency alert systems are very locally driven. And it is very much dependent on the local alert originators to create the message and send it out. And it's the same in the wireless emergency alert system, where the wireless providers receive an authorized and authenticated alert from FEMA, and they disperse it as they've been directed to a geographically targeted area, as the geographically targeted area has been also designated by the local alert originators. Um, so we need to keep in mind that uh, local alert originators really um, you know, need to build WIA into their best practices, make sure that they are using all the functionality that's available to them within the wireless emergency alert system. So a little bit about WIA and what it does. It is based on a purpose-built, mission-critical, standards-based cell broadcast technology. So what that means is, it was, as um, 
uh, Al or and, and Greg talked about when WIA was first designed, it was intended to get a message out to as many people as efficiently as possible through um, this broadcast technology. So we didn't want to have the situation that you might have had 10 years ago if you sent a Happy New Year text message um, right after midnight on New Year's Eve, it might have taken a little while to get in because ever to get to your recipient because everyone's sending that message at the same time. So we is designed to avoid that type of congestion to get the message out as quickly and efficiently as possible through cell broadcast technologies. And over the years, um, a number of enhancements have been added in. So right now, we uh, is limited to 90 characters. But per the FCC's rules, wireless providers and a number of the handsets that are out there support the expanded 360 characters um, that uh, that would allow for more content to be added into WIA. And we're all, um, you know, looking at uh, and we, we awaiting FEMA to put in that capability so the message can be um, sent out. Uh, in addition, wireless providers have enabled more geographic targeting. So. At first, WIA was limited to a county-level broadcast, but that's not the case anymore. The local alert originators can target a message to a more granular area, and the FCC has also put in rules um, that expect that the wireless providers participating in WIA provide even more location-aware uh, geographic um, emergency alerts, which uh, you know the carriers and the industry are actively working towards. Um, but let's talk a little bit about we as accessibility not only um, to non-English speakers but also people uh, who are deaf or hard of hearing or have disabilities. I think um, Greg or uh, I think Justin pointed out that that's an important area to serve, and that's why we has been designed to meet the needs of people who are deaf and hard of hearing. It has a unique tone, so if you are blind, you will you will be able to hear it. Um, and know that it is different from other messages, and it has a unique vibration cadence, so if you're deaf, you will know that it will uh, trigger something different and, and an expectation for um, the device. Um, so, you know, there, I think in terms of additional language support, uh, the, we, the new capabilities that are coming online will support Spanish language, but because WIA is a standards-based capability, it is limited to certain languages that it can currently support in terms of the initial message content that a local alert originator can create. But here's the thing. A couple of years ago, the FCC required that uh, wireless providers support the ability to embed a link to a website within a WIA message. And that capability is available today. So if a local alert originator wants to create a website that has emergency information with multimedia content, multiple languages, any type of content that they'd like to see that is, goes beyond what the current contours of the wireless emergency alert protocol include, they can do that on a separate website, just including a link in the WIA message that's sent out. So I think one of the things that we'd like to see um, is more local alert originators utilizing that capability to get more information out, um, working into their best practices, how to use that effectively, because you want to make sure that in an emergency situation, if you're sending people to a website, you're not your website's going to be able to support the traffic that's being sent to them. Um, you're not sending them, you know, 20 minute videos that they have to download uh, over the wireless network, which might cause some some congestion issues. Um, but there is the ability to have more multimedia, feature rich content um, that directed to the um, consumers who are receiving wireless emergency alerts through an embedded link that's available today. So of course, I think we're interested in seeing how uh, you know we can further work to enhance and improve wireless emergency alerts. I don't think anyone's less resting on their laurels. We're very proud of the success so far uh, with with WIA. Um, I forgot to mention that there have been over 44,000 wireless emergency alert messages that have been sent since 2012, and those have helped warn people about hurricanes, flooding, fires, terrorist events, uh, missing or abducted children. Um, and all of those have usually resulted in significant successes in terms of getting people to safety and saving lives. So we are very interested in how we can further enhance the wireless emergency alert system, but we are very proud of its success so far. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Um, so we, before we get to the audience questions, um, and because okay, it would like to keep on time here, but we do have a couple of follow-up questions, or I have a couple of questions for the panelists. Um, Justin, could you talk just a little bit about STAs and 
and and how that might help um, a, a emergency management authority to, for example, if, if their station went down or something and, and they wanted to uh, set up some kind of a, a temporary transmitter to issue um, emergency information in a different language, sure. uh, how we would help folks do that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so within the FCC, we have the FCC Operations Center, which is a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week operations center. Um, when events occur, we get all spun up and everybody increases their work hours and the operations center goes on full alert and we begin receiving messages, requests for information, requests for assistance, requests for a special temporary authority, a request for waivers. Um, so as David mentioned, whenever a, a, a broadcast entity needs assistance, if, some, if something happens in a specific area, like a hurricane or a wildfire where broadcast equipment goes down, other broadcasters in the area may be able to um, amplify their power, their broadcast power in order to get those messages out to those folks that are currently impacted. Um, so uh, through the operations center, um, which is, you know, it, after duty hours, if, if it's after, you know, eight, eight, 6 p.m., 1800, then, you know, broadcasters can request special temporary authority or waivers of FCC rules in order to either amplify power or to put uh, temporary equipment in place to um, go ahead and promulgate the messages uh, that were temporarily impacted by that incident. Um, so we do have the capability internally to go ahead and grant them on the fly, and then you know sometimes it's better to ask forgiveness than permission, right? So the next day we're we're you know begging begging forgiveness. Uh, just as long as we get the message out, I think everybody is completely understanding of being able to grant those temporary authorities and being able to issue those waivers. So um, yeah, if if you ever need anything, if anyone ever needs anything, and it's it's after duty hours or you just don't know who to get in contact with, the FCC Operations Center is available to go ahead and grant that uh, grant that assistance. Um, you know, just to plug the Operations Center a little bit more, if if you need ever need somebody, uh, if you never need to talk to anybody in the FCC Operations Center, the number is 202-418-1122. So, yeah, thanks, thank Justin. <laughs> and I realize that's not necessarily a multilingual issue in specific, but Correct. that could be an instance where uh, you could have a Spanish language station or, or a, a non-English speaking station go down and you, you may need to find some temporary means to uh, get the message out. And so this is a way you might be able to, some uh, station might be able to set up Absolutely. a temporary transmitter or something. So it's in that context that I wanted to raise that. Greg, I wondered if you could talk about the work of the IEC. And sure, happy to do it. Happy to, you want to give that number again there, Justin? <laughs> okay, I can do that. 202-418-1122. Thank you. You know, I think um, uh, we had mentioned a little bit the fact that that of that we of the commission has one of its advisory committees because the called the intergovernmental advisory committee, and and what the IAC is is it's an advisory committee that is composed of elected and appointed officials from municipal, county, state, and tribal governments. And it's tasked to, to deal with the, those issues of importance to their citizens, to, to their communities, and to make recommendations uh, as tasked by the, by the FCC chairman to provide recommendations to the commission on specific um, uh, uh, telecommunications issues which in the FCC's jurisdiction that affect those governments. So it's like any one of our other advisory committees, these are experts. And we ask them to, to, we have particular issues that we think are, that the commission thinks are relevant to state, local government, et cetera, tribal governments, to please give us recommendations on these issues. So for example, this year, uh, the IAC is tasked with recommending best practices for incorporating multi multilingual alerts into the state's emergency communications and response plans. And one of our IAC members, Andy Huckabo, is scheduled to be on the second panel today, and, and it's a shame. His flight was canceled. He's not going to be able to make it. Uh, and uh, we really miss him, because I think he'd have a lot to offer. He's been doing a great job. He's been the acting chair of the IAC for the last six months, and we really want to thank him for the wonderful, wonderful job that he's been doing. And, and his, his contribution to today's workshop, he has a statement I'll read during the second panel as well as all of the work we're doing here today will really help all of us have a better understanding of how state, local, and tribal governments can provide their, their English, non-English speaking communities with alerts, but also will provide the IAC, who some of whom are here, some of whom are watching over the live stream, with very helpful information as to how to formulate the proper guidelines and best practices uh, for, the, for their upcoming report. Okay, 
Thanks, Greg. I'll, uh, FEMA has an app that's available, a downloadable app to uh, uh, get alerts. And I wondered if you could, I noticed that it says that it, it provides uh, uh, the information in both English and Spanish, and I wondered if you could talk just a little bit about that. <laughs> Strangely enough, I have nothing to do with the FEMA app. Uh, the FEMA app, um, no, it, it, I, it really doesn't interface with, uh, uh, with iPods. Sorry to disappoint, you, you, disappoint you. you. So that's not pushed out through the all hazards feed? No, it isn't. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, it should be. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and it should work much better than it does. But it, uh, it's an evolving product. Okay. Um, You've got to bring that one home there, right? Uh, Orlando, uh, do you, does NOAA have uh, an, an app that, uh, that where you provide, uh, that you push weather alerts out through? Um, and if it does, do you know if, does, does the work that you guys do for providing Spanish translations of those, is that uh, available through that app? Um, NOAA doesn't have an app. Uh, we do uh, we do have something that is really similar to an app, which is our website. Um, and you basically go into the, our website, and if you are, let's say, in the Washington, D.C. area, you uh, click on the National Weather Service for the area, and the, the, the face of that website um, it will get, get you to uh, click on certain links, and that's how you uh, take the information for any warnings that are out. Uh, but that's the closest thing that we have as an app. And I just want to take this opportunity um, to also mention that our group, Mass Team, uh, we do interviews. So whenever we have a, a, a high impact event, our group gets activated and we right away um, tell, take interviews and that way we also put the word out um, the, for the public. So let's say that there's no one in this area that speaks Spanish and a warning has to be out uh, in the Spanish language. Um, the, the, the group gets activated and whoever is available uh, takes the call and put that message out in Spanish. All right. Thanks. Th thank you, Orlando. Uh, are there any questions in the audience for our distinguished panelists? Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah. Dave? Oh, hi. Hi, quick question for the Western Weather Service. Is there a plan to begin uh, sending in CAP messages in uh, bilingual format from National Weather Service to FEMA? That is in place. Um, we, as of right now, we only have a couple of different offices that they have transmitters to go ahead and do so um, automatically. Uh, with the new system that we have now in place, uh, there are more chances for other offices to go ahead and provide that service. As uh, today, there are only certain amount of offices that have that capability. And, and that's why I'm bringing up our service that uh, if the need is there, um, at least we can translate and do interviews and pose uh, into social media, which is uh, a, a one of the biggest things these days. Uh, we do the translation and then go into the Twitter feed and Facebook uh, and, and all the other stuff that is out there. Thank you. Uh, hi, Monty Taylor, Com Daily. I got a question for Mr. Hook. Is there any kind of timeline for when the uh, IEC might have those recommendations on multilingual alerting and, and send them to the FCC? Um, I think the, I, I, the IAC's uh, current um, a charter was, was extended until September. So I would expect we would have it during, at some point during that time. Thank you so much. Good morning, I'm Sandra Bechana. Actually, I'm the bilingual writer editor uh, in Spanish. I have a question, as you mentioned, me, uh, social media. Uh, one big concern would be 
how do you detect when there is no, and I don't want to use this, it's not the best word to use because it's been too used, but misinformation or disinformation in social media, which is also called fake news. How do we, we make sure that people know that it actually is from FEMA, but not anywhere else, considering the problems of Facebook, et cetera? Okay, thank you. Uh, oh, is that something? FEMA makes very little use of social media the, the, uh, uh, for alerting purposes. Uh, the alerts that are issued by or requested by local authorities that go, run through IPAWS are directed to wireless emergency alerts or EAS. If a local jurisdiction wishes to uh, uh, tweet a, a, um, a situation, they'll do it locally uh, through, their, uh, through their own systems. Uh, most, many jurisdictions also have uh, Facebook pages and, all, and other social media uh, fronts that are established. So if you see something that, is, that tracks back to the, uh, the Facebook page of your local jurisdiction that you're familiar with, you can have confidence in that. Uh, something that does not track back to it, uh, it may be just a, a, a citizen comment who's trying to be helpful or someone who's not trying to be helpful, as you, as, as you indicated. Just, uh, social media is, uh, to a certain extent, the wild west of, uh, of, of, of information sources, and so one has to be very careful with uh, um, how they react to it. Uh, since anyone can contribute, you have to sort out the, uh, uh, the nuggets from the noise. And let me just add to what Al said. Um, the systems, the wireless emergency alert system and the emergency alert system are, uh, the security of these systems is a primary concern of the FCC. And I think the fact that these are essentially closed systems where you know where the source is, where you know that, I mean, the classic model for an alerting system is trusted source, communication structure, and the, and the, and the government. And so having that trusted source be trusted is, is key if, if you want people to believe the alert and you want them to respond to it correctly. So security of these systems is prior, has been priority one for the commission. And uh, one of our other advisory committees, the, the, uh, the CISRIC, let me see if I get this right, the Communications uh, Security and Reliability and Interoperability uh, Advisory Committee came up with guidelines a number of years ago for the emergency alert system uh, for the TV and the radio and the cable folks to follow to make sure that their systems are secure so that what they broadcast to the public is what's sent out from uh, National Weather Service or, or other trusted sources. And the same is true for WIA. I, I think that Matt could probably talk about this, that the security of these networks, the security of cable networks is is something that uh, that we don't talk about a lot but, but uh, gathers a tremendous amount of attention. Yeah, if I could add to it as well, um, I, I always just want to caution people about using social media as a primary form of alerting anyway. Social media is a great crowdsourced uh, application where if you have multiple reporting then then you can kind of val validate the information a little bit more and it's better for first responders as some pe some people just don't have access to anything except for you know some social media application when they need it so it is helpful in that fashion but always you know leverage it against existing and um, you know validated products and solutions before before just kind of you know responding um, you know via social media um, in addition to that I'd like to kind of tug on the thread a little bit of what Larry said earlier you know, eventually we'd like to get to a point where that the end user devices are going to have the ability to go ahead and translate for the user. You know, it, that'd be a great application to have. And I know that there are a number of coalitions out there trying to develop these applications that not only uh, provide more useful information to individuals during disasters, but also help to, um, you know, use crowdsourcing information, use information from other government websites to try and uh, identify evacuation routes. Um, so I think, you know, as a society, if we, if we try and push and encourage applications like that, and then, you know, in the advent of 5G where we begin to see more smart technologies available, I mean, wouldn't it be great if you're going to the fridge to grab a beer and the fridge says, put the beer back, there's an earthquake or, or there's a fire or something? I mean, right, that'd be great. So, so smart devices, the ability for smart devices um, and, and the opportunity for smart devices in this advent of newer technologies to go ahead and promulgate uh, alerting, I think these are resources that we need to start looking at using. Um, so innovation is, is critical. And I, I think innovation for first responders or innovation for law enforcement is always kind of placed on a, black, on a back burner because, you know, it doesn't really sell as much. But I think 
you know, those groups, I like to thank those groups that, that are out there thinking about things like that and putting those, those think tanks together to be able to develop capabilities like these because there are people, we've already talked about people with foreign language uh, who speak foreign languages who can't get alerts. We've talked about people who are, who are deaf or hard of hearing who can't get these alerts. We need to be able to protect the people in our society and the best way to do that is through working together as a community and developing these innovations that'll assist. You know, so we might as well leverage the resources we have at hand. We might as well leverage this evolving technology and communications to go ahead and support these efforts. So, thank you. And one, oh, I'm sorry. No, I just, I, I go was going to point out that I think this is the first time I've ever heard uh, beer and emergency alerts <laughs> in the same uh, example. So well played, sir. Well played. I'm so, pleased. Yeah, although, <laughs> although you might want to have it say, take that to the basement with you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> An underlying point here is that any one of these systems is just one tool in the toolkit. There's no one answer fits all. EAS is great, WE is great, social media has value, uh, 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 text messaging has value, all of these things have value and there literally is no one size fits all. So I think one of the things that we'll see particularly in the second panel is how emergency managers use all of these various tools to solve the problem of how do you reach your non-English speaking communities. Thank you. Matt. Thanks, um, I'm Matt with CTIA. And I just wanted to, ec one, first echo what Greg's saying. I think all of these alerting tools are one tool in the toolbox and it is incumbent on the alert originators to know how to use them and when to use them most effectively. Um, in the case of you know using innovation at the edge or on the device or to uh, help with emergency alerting, of course we should be looking at whatever capabilities are available to us. But we should be a little bit cautious about the idea of automatic translation at the edge. Greg made the point of how what is an effective alerting process. You want to have a trusted source and it should be the source of the information that is producing that information you want to go out to the consumers. If at the end of the process you have another system that's translating that in a way that you may not be may not be in the same way, um, you may have errors in the type of information that's being communicated out. And so I think we want to be cautious about that and take advantage of the capabilities that we do have at our disposal. For example, as I said, I think more effective use of the embedded link capability in AWEA will allow the alert originators to direct people to a website that will have all the content that they can build out. So let's, let's try to focus on the things that we do have at our disposal and keep an eye on the future. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Uh, well, thank you, everybody. Um, did anybody have any, anything else they'd like to say? Oh, I just wanted to say, um, just basically make sure that you bookmark the trusted sources, uh, such as the Hurricane Center and the National Weather Service, and you'll be good uh, on any type of emergency. Um, they, those are the ones that are going to give you the best information uh, possible out there in both languages, in this case, English and Spanish. Thank you. I will thank you, panelists, uh, for attending and everybody for participating. We'll take a 10-minute uh, break and we'll start back up with panel two at 10:15. Thank you.
All right. Shall we? Okay. No, actually, I'm not sure. Right. You're all set? Yes, go. Okay. Hi, folks. Are we on? Yeah. Hi, folks. If we could uh, come uh, uh, get back to our seats, please. We're, we're going to start the second panel. Uh, oh, could you pass me my water? I am, I am. All right. Hey, thanks, everybody. Um, so we're about to start the second panel. And what this panel is going to do is it will present examples of how state and local jurisdictions have implemented uh, multiple alerting and offer best practices for other jurisdictions. Uh, the discussion will cover multimedia, multilingual communications to supplement the EAS and WIA, uh, such as leveraging the internet, using email or social networking. And in addition, the discussion will cover alternatives for EAS and WIA for delivering emergency information to a non, the non-English speaking public. And then we'll do questions afterwards. So we're going to follow the same format that we, that we followed in the first panel, which is that each one of the participants will deliver about a, a five to seven minute presentation, after which we will follow, we will have questions. And I just wanted to remind people of a couple of things, that um, this is being streamed live, it's being streamed live with open captioning in both English and Spanish, and that, the, um, and that it is being uh, archived and will be available uh, at the FCC.gov and also on the FCC's uh, YouTube page after, after the event. So let me just take a quick minute to, to introduce our panel. Uh, first, we have John Dooley from the uh, 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 Minnesota Department of Public Safety. We have Fred Angle, who is the Chief Technology Officer from the University of North Carolina TV. We have we would have Andy Huckaba. Andy uh, Andy is well, Andy's flight was canceled, and Andy Huckaba, who is. Um, a council member from Lenexa, Kansas, but also is the acting chief of our Intergovernmental Advisory Committee, and unfortunately his plane was canceled. He can't join us. He gave me a, a little uh, a statement, which is that um, he said this is their statement of principle that we should assume, and I guess this is IAC's statement of principle as they're working on their report, is that we should assume communities have the responsibility to alert all people in their geographic parameters of emergency situations regardless of language or physical impairment. And he said this can be done through a combination of legacy systems and through non-language based approaches. There are significant gaps in the current systems due to cord cutting and an increased reliance on streaming. And I uh, he is hopeful that the combination of all of these approaches allow us to realize the principles stated above. So again, thank you, Andy, for your service to the IAC. Uh, and then uh, after Andy would have been Jesus Salas, who is the Executive Vice President of Programming for Spanish Broadcasting Systems in Miami. Francisco Sanchez, the Deputy Emergency Management Coordinator for Harris County, Texas. Uh, Aaron Wilborn from Dick Broadcasting Company for uh, Savannah, Georgia and Anna Woodleaf, Chief Technology Officer for Georgia Public Broadcasting. And I please, and, and again, uh, let's start with John. One thing as we're doing this that I, I'm curious about, it, it, that for anybody who can sew into it, is how you determine your communities of interest and what you do to make sure that they're buying into whatever particular approach you have, if that's relevant to your, to, to your uh, discussion. But in any event, John, take, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Um, my name is John Dooley. I'm with the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. I work in the Division of Emergency Communication Networks. Long title, small department. We handle anything from the uh, 911 system, working with all the, the local authorities there, the statewide radio system. We also handle uh, and work with the locals on their selection to FirstNet. And then finally, like I always tell all, all my coworkers, I'm the last guy you want to talk to in public safety because that means we have a dark day out there and we are going to be going out and putting a message out to the public telling them that they have to do something to save themselves. So with that, uh, my primary focus of my job is threefold. Uh, the first one, I work with uh, FEMA and the FCC quite a bit. Al, nice to, to finally meet you in person. Greg, same thing with David. Working with everybody there to make sure that we have all the tools in place. 
the second part of my job is to work out there with the broadcasters and the EES participants as I really try to focus in on that because for so many years we've been talking about broadcasters, but yet cable is a, a very big part of it and so is now some of the telco companies producing that uh, and putting out that kind of content. So we're working with those folks to make sure that we have the things ready to go. And then last but not least, I work with all the public safety entities, the people who are going to be the alerters out there, that alerting authority is going to send that message out and getting those folks trained and ready to go for their worst day. You know, when they realize that they have to, you know, the public calls 911, they have a reasonable rec expectation that we're going to come out and we're going to do something about it. And when we get out there and realize it's bigger than what, what it really is, and we need those folks, the public, to respond to it, we'll be able to do that with the public alert warning and getting that effective message out. So far to date in the state of Minnesota since November of 2015 when we started on our first venture of training public uh, uh, alert originators, we have now trained over 560 of them. With that, some of the work that we have been doing since 2004, Twin Cities Public Television has been working gallantly with uh, public safety about getting messages out, getting preparedness messages out through, through their system. EES, for the longest time until 2013, was the only, English was the only way we were going to get those messages out there. Uh, 2013 came along, we had a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Twin Cities Public Television took the lead on that and realized, hey, we really don't have a good way of getting out to our other served communities. And the question that Greg asked about how did we figure that out, we did it by population level you know, on that one. We had a very large Hmong population in Minnesota. We have a very large Somali population and a very large Spanish population. And there are probably some jurisdictions that put out their pre-information, their preparatory things in a lot more languages than that. But that's, we figured those were the first top three besides English that we needed to really get out and work with those communities. So with that, we uh, went through, worked quite a bit with the FCC. We actually did some, uh, got a waiver, Twin City Public Television did, to, uh, to use some EES informational material using the tones so that we could, could get those out. In the answer, one of the questions that was on the past panel uh, before, uh, we had to do a lot of outreach. Uh, Lily McDonald and Echo did a phenomenal job of reaching out there through that grant period and talking with those communities. In the Somali language, there is no word for tornado. That is probably our biggest threat out there to citizens in the state of Minnesota, you know, besides floods and severe thunderstorms. You know, the uh, terrorism, yes, we're preparing for it. We do all the things we need to do. But the uh, Mother Nature, I think, is our, probably our biggest terroristic threat that we have in Minnesota. So with that, evolved into ECHO and Twin Cities Public Television had worked together. They realized that through that grant process that Twin ECHO had a bigger role in broadcasting. So they became part of Twin Cities Public Television and worked out quite a, a, uh, a deal there where we came up with what they call TPT Now. It is a channel that is dedicated to public safety information, getting weather information out there, news feeds, and when the time comes through that grant, it was able to set off EES messages Right now, it's just the headers. We still have to physically get people in there to do the translations, the follow-up, and everything else. But the headers in English, Somali, Hmong, and Spanish. Given that, with that, we've gone through and tried to brand it as a trusted source. Where do we drive people to get to that information? Where are they going to get information not only after the alert goes out, but prior to? A lot of the things that are being done out there, we're working with not only TPT now, but the Department of Public Safety and TPT have, have formed a partnership 
to start going with all the preparatory things. Also, our, our Region 6 emergency managers, which account for probably about half of the state of Minnesota's population in a 10-county area, have worked with them quite a bit to get those preparatory things out there. We're now sending out and making, we're making graphics in multilingual ones so that we can distribute it to our broadcasters, our cable, and our telcos to put out on their social media feeds things that where people need to go to get information, what things mean, you know, and it's all all being done in a very, very uh, good fashion. It's also streamed at tpt.org slash tpt now. That is the channel that goes on and people can see that information on there. So they're really making use of all kinds of different technologies. And hopefully we have gone through and done a couple test exercises. Thankfully, with the uh, with the capabilities that FEMA has uh, given us out there with the test lab, we have gone offline and gone through and tested these uh, capabilities so that when we have a disaster, now we realize what kind of graphics will look good on television. Before in public safety, we had no clue. We printed out maps for the nuclear power plant exercises that, hey, they look good on paper. When it came to throw it up on television, we really had an eye opener, you know, for the things that we had to do with that. So that has really helped us out. We've done that radiological drill in 2017. Uh, we did a health-related one for anthrax in 2018, using the Twin Cities Public Television and the Echo Crew to go through and provide these translations and to provide follow-on materials for to get from that trusted source. And hopefully this fall, we're going to start up with the Community Resiliency Council and getting things done there and really pushing this forward. But I think the biggest thing is that we really can't move forward. Everyone has their own limits. It comes down to where can we get more grant opportunities for this. The outreach to the community has to continue. Uh, leaders take not only in the public safety side but in the communities, you know, will rotate through and uh, you know, they'll, they'll go away and then new ones will come in there. And, but I think the biggest thing is the biggest challenge we have in public safety right now is public outreach. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, 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 thank you, John. Uh, Fred. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Greg and Dave, for having us uh, having us all here today, and uh, and a, a special thank you from all of us in North Carolina. Um, the uh, UNC TV is uh, part of the Nor University of North Carolina system, um, and we are an affiliate with the system, and the, and the system is, consists of 17 you know, universities and campuses throughout the state. UNC TV's broadcast signal covers about 99% of the um, you know, geographic space in, in, in North Carolina through uh, 12 full power transmitters and a number of uh, translators throughout the state. Um, we're also part of the public broadcasting system, and uh, we're very proud of that. Uh, and you know, P P PBS itself has a kind of a, 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 a three pillars of, of foundation uh, of what we're all about. It's obviously been education for a long time, uh, civic engagement, and and public safety has has, has really come up to the top of uh, one of the most important things that we're doing uh, throughout the system. And we're going to so I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing in North Carolina. Uh, our mission at North UNC TV is to connect North Carolinians with each other, and uh, there is no better way to do that during in, during times of crisis. Uh, so, so we, we try to do that. I'll talk a little bit about what we uh, uh, what we and specifically what we do. Uh, the the State Emergency Operations Center in in Raleigh. Uh, we have a, a very strong relationship them with them and the Department of Public Safety in North Carolina. And for a number of years, we have been doing live broadcasts of emergency events uh, that where the governor and, and officials from the Department of Public Safety or, and National Guard and others would come on and talk about whatever that particular event in is. And you know, most of them have been uh, storm and hurricane related. Um, uh, we've been doing that for a number of years. Uh, the, uh, uh, we used to... Uh, Uplink them via satellite for the other media outlets to take. In the last few years, we've uh, gone to doing a web stream, and uh, that has been uh, particularly popular. Uh, it, it, it kind of a funny story is when we first did our first web stream uh, for uh, Hurricane Matthew, the first of, uh, time the governor spoke, we had three views. I think two of them were people in the house, and uh, the first stream for. Um, 
uh, the first announcement for prior to Hurricane Florence, we had a well over 100,000 stream views. And we share that with every media outlet worldwide, anybody that wants it. Um, the, uh, so we've been looking at the, 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 the briefings of what, these briefings we would want, do a couple of them a day uh, prior to the storm. Uh, the, bad, the good thing about a hurricane, if there is a good thing about a hurricane, you kind of know when it's coming, and so you can prepare a little bit. So we, you know, the governor and his team would get uh, do one or two different briefings a day uh, prior to the event, and then uh, as we get into the event, uh, uh, less, and then of course after the event, it's more of the relief efforts that come from that. Um, after Hurricane Florence, soon after that, uh, um, FCC came to visit the North Carolina Association of Broadcasters, and we, we sat down, we, we kind of shared with them. It was a, a harrowing experience for all of us. Um, fortunately for UNC TV, we were able to keep our entire network up functional in, in, through the entire event. Um, other uh, uh, um, broadcasters and others had difficulties with, with uh, flooding and fuel d deliveries because everybody was on emergency generators and all. Um, and so we, we told our story about that. But one of the questions the, uh, the FCC had uh, was about uh, how are we reaching uh, the Spanish-speaking population in North Carolina? And that number is somewhere between 9 and 10 percent of the population now. It's grown, it's grown quite a bit. And uh, we realized that we were not doing a very good job of that. So working with the state e uh, EOC folks, um, we are coming up with a plan to uh, address that for this season, hopefully. Uh, and, and what we're going to do on that right now is, uh, and, and I, was, I was looking at Orlando, that uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about this. Uh, our initial plan on this, working with the EOC folks, is uh, they have access to uh, um, uh, the Spanish interpret interpreter community. These folks, uh, a lot of these folks work in the courts. And so to be a, uh, an interpreter in the court, you have to be certified at a certain level of competency. And so we're going to work with one, uh, some, some of these folks to um, do a test where we um, um, have a governor's speech with uh, or governor's announcement with some of the other uh, folks and going to have that person try to interpret a recording of one of those events and then have that person uh, interpret that. And then we're going to capture that, and we're going to go back and, and review that to see, you know, did we disseminate enough information here? We want to be able to do this in, in, in live. We want to do it as the governor is doing his uh, speech, that we can uh, do that interpretation as close to live as we can. We want to, well, we will continue to broadcast and, and, and stream and caption, live caption in English all of this. We hope to be able then to provide a secondary audio channel for our broadcast uh, with the, with the Spanish, and then uh, uh, we're working with a, uh, a vendor on an automatic uh, captioning device to, to we're trying to tune that to, to do uh, both English and Spanish uh, captioning. And uh, we're, we're looking at probably creating a second uh, uh, web stream, one Spanish, um, um, Spanish language with Spanish caption. That's our goal with this, so that we'll make then both of those web streams available to any media outlet. Uh, for the, and, and we'll post it on our website and uh, through our app and all. So that's our, our hope. Uh, to, we're working on that right now. Be ready for, the, for this uh, upcoming hurricane season. So give you a sense of what we're trying to do in North Carolina. Super. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Oh, it is. Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, I started on radio. I don't know if you can hear me. I don't need the mic. <laughs> let's, let's turn this around. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here, an honor to be here, and uh, all the panelists that I've, I've had the pleasure to meet um, and learn from today. It's very important and uh, terrific that we are all here. The FCC has uh, created this workshop to relay the message of how important it is to save lives no matter what language you speak or understand. Uh, I'm the EVP of Programming for Spanish Broadcasting Systems. Uh, we have stations in New York, LA, Chicago, Puerto Rico, Miami, and San Francisco. Uh, very highly rated stations, most listened to. We have about 15 million listeners a week. Um, I don't know how many of you here in the audience or the panelists have lived through a hurricane or not. I have, many. And it's not a pretty sight, as we all know. Uh, the first thing to go is the power. Sometimes it goes when first rain hits, there goes TV. Uh, the thing that's on 
most of the time, all the time, is a battery-powered radio. That has been the source of information for all of our listeners in every single market, and they all have said that if it would not have been for us to be broadcasting 24 hours a day, that they would not know what to do, where to go, how to take care of themselves in these times of crisis, whether it be natural or man-made. The last hurricane that was very impactful to us and our population in Puerto Rico it was Hurricane Maria. Actually, there was a few hurricanes that passed by, and Hurricane Maria was the one that caused the major destruction in the island. We knew that was coming, therefore we created a hurricane relief um, effort. We had our audiences all across the country, New York and Miami and Los Angeles, donate water, generators, all the necessities that were going to be required. And we were able to charter a plane to be the first plane to land in Puerto Rico the day following Hurricane Maria with 100,000 tons of um, food canned food, water, generators, backup antennas for our radio stations, which were, we were very lucky to be on air the whole time. All the TV stations were off, cell service was down, couldn't grab the internet on the phones. It was the FM and AM stations that were still on the whole time. We linked up all of our radio stations together. Uh, we don't translate because we immediately disseminate the information in the language that our listeners are understanding and, and expect from us. We also do uh, bilingual in English, you know, advisories as well. We do both of them on our stations, but mostly all in Spanish. In our network, whether it's an earthquake in Los Angeles or in the West Coast, we link up all of our stations together. We have our own talent reporting and giving us daily, uh, hourly, 15-minute updates to our audience. Not only do we look at NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Advisor Administration, for the updates, but we also do this ourselves. We have a, an emergency coordinator at each of our stations that is responsible and accountable to receive the alerts and to make sure that it's disseminated to the correct people and it gets on air. We at uh, Spanish Broadcasting Systems, I'm Mr. Raul Alarcón, our president, CEO, and um, chief executive officer. He, he says, you know, in his words, it's an honor for us to have a civic duty for our audience to inform, relay for their safety. That's, that's the number one key here. It's, it's how do we get them to safety? How do we let them know where to go, what they need to do in order to be ready? We do it before during and after. And if you have not uh, noticed, but radio stations um, are the ones that continue to broadcast. We link up with some TV stations and do simulcasts as well. We uh, recently provided some capsules for our friend here. Uh, in Spanish, quick one minute capsules with the information needed by, for that audience. It's a duty and an honor to be able to do this. Um, I don't know if everyone here knows or not, um, our cell phones have an FM chip. They're not activated yet. That is something that in cases of these emergencies would be a terrific thing to have activated to be able to receive these inf this information, especially when cell towers go down. If you have an FM receiver on your phone, how terrific would that be to continue to receive information in, in whichever language you need to receive it. The social media aspect of dissemination of the emergency alerts is a terrific idea, but as someone in the audience um, participating here mentioned, it's not credible at this moment because people don't know whether it's real or not. We are accountable as broadcasters and license holders to make sure that we confirm all of the information that we relay on air. It is critical for diversity purposes that we continue to push for minority ownership of media. We're the largest Hispanic only owned company in the United States and we're minority certified as well. And what I would continue with this workshop here is that 
not only do we have the energy and the passion, as everyone here is, for public safety, but that we actually execute after this symposium. It's great to talk about it, great to discuss, great to meet each other, but how and what steps are going to be taken after this day to implement this. Spanish broadcasting systems will help anyone, any medium, any media company if they need help in translating or actually broadcasting in Spanish. We have 11 stations in Puerto Rico. We cover it 24-7. And it's, uh, it's an honor to be here. Hopefully we can gain something very positive out of this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Francisco. Thank you, Jesus. I'll use the microphone because I have a, a face for radio and a voice for print. So, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, uh, you know, when I ask my colleagues across the country, whether they're from small jurisdictions or large jurisdictions, I ask, hey, who's doing this great? And nobody raises their hand. Um, they're doing it well, they're, they're trying hard at it, they're, they're doing good at it, um, but it is one of those gaps that continues to be out there and a moving target. So I thank the FCC for putting this uh, discussion together and the opportunity to, to hopefully uh, learn some lessons and, and see how we can keep moving uh, the ball forward. Uh, I'll talk more broadly than sort of the IPAW system because from the emergency management side, um, it, it, it's a broader ecosystem. And for us, we, we, we scale up uh, what, what, what platforms we use depending on the threat and the risk. Um, and, and all of that ties into the alerts and warnings piece. Uh, but you know, what is the challenge and what is the problem to, to Greg's question about how do we identify those, those communities in, 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 that are of interest? Um, you know, in Harris County alone, it's the third largest county in the country populace wise. Uh, 145 languages are spoken, um, almost evenly divided uh, ethnically between you know, uh, a third Latino, a third uh, uh, white, and a third other. Um, uh, so it's interesting. Um, and, and, and one of the challenges uh, that I would caution to is to be cautious about what statistics you use uh, to identify what languages you ought to be prioritizing. Um, you know, we had a regional team that recently did uh, an analysis and it had a certain list of names, but they actually uh, um, included uh, uh, an understanding of primary language. So uh, when you're talking about another language aside from English, it doesn't mean they, they don't understand English. Um, so understanding that factor helps us prioritize. And I just recently saw another study uh, from another group that didn't take that into account. So all of that, you have to take it to uh, understand that. You know, don't just take a study at its value. You want to be able to dig a little deeper to make sure that um, you're targeting those communities in which that uh, there are greater needs, especially as you've got limited resources to address some of these issues. Um, it would be great to tackle them all at once, but this way you can look at what those challenges are uh, and, and attack the, uh, the, the biggest uh, you know, the, the, the needs of the community first, uh, and obviously making sure that we address um, deaf and hard of hearing you know, as a part of that. Um, and now we have, uh, and also we've got the 10th largest media market. Um, and in Houston, we're fortunate to have you know, three, language, uh, three, three uh, television stations and dozens of radio that, that, that do Spanish. Um, and, and, and they do that well, and they operate 24-7. Um, and they've got robust capabilities, uh, but that's in large part because of the incredible market share that, 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 that the Hispanic community has. We find that there are uh, other uh, 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 media companies out there that don't have that type of capability. You've got other uh, communities, that, uh, other, uh, other media that are targeting non-English speakers but might just be on, on, on radio uh, certain times of the day or might just be a community newspaper. Um, and while all those are great to do some, some targeted and outreach, um, you know, you don't need someone getting that alert a week later because that's, <laughs> that's, that's when they can do it. So understanding not just the communities, but what resources are out there um, and, and understand that's part of the challenge and, and, and to build to that capacity. Um, some folks have touched on this already of not just simply translating. Um, you know, uh, a couple of careers ago when I was doing uh, marketing for, you know, for some Hispanic marketing, we would say you ought to transcreate, not translate. Um, and I think that's equally important in public safety and to be able to make sure that we are cult culturally competent in, in how we tackle uh, addressing multiple languages uh, and how we provide that information. And there's also some, a tendency to say, all right, we have provided this alert in this language, so we're done. But we don't do that. Uh, uh, for our English speakers. We, we hit multiple platforms, we repeat that message, uh, uh, we do it as often as the social science tells us we ought to do and then some. Um, and so understanding uh, that those, uh, it needs to be just a consistent approach across the board in terms of how we, how we address that. 
Um, and we need to know where these con communities are consuming information. Um, you know, sometimes we look at English speakers as, as a, you know, we know it's not a homogenous community. Um, and so we tailor that. And understanding we were dealing with those languages, um, those aren't necessarily hom homogenous communities either. Um, so taking that into account and understanding the complexities of that, uh, you know, I think is critically uh, important. Uh, in short, I think we can assume, um, uh, we can't assume that, that, that some of these non-English communities uh, consume information like we do. There, there, there are some, uh, some issues with that that we need to be aware of. Someone talked about preparedness information, uh, and that's important at a trust level. Um, there's a, 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 anywhere in this country, you, uh, public safety finds a challenge of there's not always, a, a, um, there are varying degrees of trust uh, in government. Um, and that might be even more so in, in, in some non-English speaking communities. And so for us, be starting uh, an entire spectrum of not only alerting information, but being able to have that preparedness information in multiple, in multiple languages uh, is critically important. It educates the community. It starts building that trust. Um, and, um, and for us, that's important for what we see as a three-step process of build trust, know to the communities, and build plans once you have that information. And knowing as your demographics change, as, 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 as they will do, um, is to just continually repeat that cycle uh, and, and, and to keep working on it. So we treat that across the board. Um, we also have a sign-up feature on our, on our local mass notification system, the opt-in system, um, uh, that, that lets you opt in, in Span to, to sign up in Spanish. That being said, um, we have to be aware that if we're offering people to sign up in Spanish, that we ought to consistently provide information in Spanish. It's, if we're doing a disservice if, if we're saying, hey, sign up, and then we're sending information in English. Uh, in English only, and I realize there's complexities to that. Um, uh, I will talk uh, in the minute or so that I got left. You know, people come home to television, despite of all these social social media and all these platforms. Um, when it's a big event, people come home to television, and the TV goes out, <laughs> and they're scrambling where to go get that information. Um, um, so for us, we have a uh, we have three three major uh, Spanish language television stations that broadcast live from our uh, from our media room. Uh, we found that oftentimes, because we were providing that information in English, uh, because the leadership really only spoke English, um, uh, what you would find is the Spanish language reporters, we talk loud in Spanish. <laughs> um, and they would have to be translating in real time uh, what was happening at the, at the podium. Um, and so one, that was a disservice, because they, they don't have the opportunity to play reporter, as they should be doing, you know, paying attention to what's being said, coming up with questions to ask. Uh, uh, in doing that, um, we, ins we we created a translation room, basically a, a soundproof little studio adjacent to the news conference room, where we have a certified translator that will automatically translate that in real time, so those Spanish language media can be broadcasting that. Uh, so it's not a competitor's voice in Spanish. It is, it is someone that's certified. But more important than just certified, uh, we try to have the same translators come because there's the issue of terminology. Um, uh, and so at least, we, the majority of events we have faced have been flooding events, rain events, natural disasters, so we, they're at least familiar with that terminology. Uh, but terminology continues to be an issue, just like tornadoes may not be available in Somali. Man, it is a different world when you have to translate naphtha, benzene, um, those kinds of things. Um, it's, it's challenging even for us to convey science in English. Imagine the, the complexities of doing that in Spanish. Um, I will also say, uh, we continue to struggle making sure occasionally that, our, that the ASL translator is in the shot, so we have to be cognizant of going back and tapping the, the camera person and say, hey, okay, I need to kind of move this up. Um, and I will, and we, we now have an elected official in, in Harris County who speaks Spanish very fluently. And so now uh, the county judge, Hidalgo, is able to speak at the podium in Spanish um, to meet those expectations. Um, but I will tell you, uh, even when we spoke, uh, even when we post in Spanish in something like Nextdoor, or we're talking Spanish at, an, at a news conference, you need to be prepared for snarky comments uh, and some pushback from some people in the community. We're doing the right thing. Um, we're not going to stop doing the right thing, um, but just be prepared to be able to respond to those kinds of things or not respond to those kinds of things, just depending on 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 what's going on in your community, what those comments are. Um, but just understand that that that, that that's out there. So. Um, 
Uh, basically, there's no silver bullet. This is going to be a complex problem. Um, this, is a gr this is a great sharing of, uh, of intelligence and subject matter expertise. I think we ought to share those resources from what other folks are doing across the country, import that so we can keep the ball moving forward um, as quickly as possible. Um, and understanding, again, I talked, touched on this, we need to speak with one voice. Uh, that's the importance of a joint information center, um, but also making sure that all the effort that we're doing and hitting all those platforms multiple times to get the message across is an essential step when we talk about uh, multi-languaging. It's not just putting out that message message once. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, Aaron. I'm not going to set my timer up. <laughs> it's very distracting over here watching your timer. <laughs> trying to go, King, you're over your time. I was over time, by the way. <laughs> we have time. <laughs> we're good. We're good. Um, Aaron Wilborn, uh, I'm the market manager for Dick Broadcasting down in Savannah, Georgia. We um, handle Savannah, Georgia, the Hilton Head, Bluffton, Beaufort area. Um, all the way down towards Brunswick, Georgia, which is right on the verge of Florida. Um, we have four radio markets. We are local broadcasters with a very large local staff in each market. So we're able to execute uh, on a whim. Um, we are in Greensboro, North Carolina. A bunch of North Carolina people here. Um, Greenville, New Bern, North Carolina, which had gotten hit pretty hard uh, in the last hurricane, and Myrtle Beach, and then in Savannah. Um, again, we're fully staffed. The we, we came across a small issue, which Jesus um, uh, was amazing, I think, in the, our partnership along this process. But when Florence uh, started coming along our way, uh, we have no Hispanic Spanish radio station in our market. Um, and it is a very large uh, Hispanic population there in that Hilton Head Bluffton area. Um, so we decided, and I was asked to speak about how we received information, how we disseminated the information, and implemented everything. Um, it was pretty simple, actually. Um, radio is quite amazing, especially with the people we have and the relationships that we have around the country and the community that one of us broadcasters can pick up the phone and in two hours it can be broadcast, put on the air, and done. So Jesus uh, was kind enough to provide us with a bunch of PSAs that um, we took from one radio station, uh, and we have six in the market. We took one of those and decided that it's not going to be a Hispanic Spanish radio station. It was going to continue in the uh, the English format, but we decided that we would take one, and we would broadcast those PSAs in Spanish just to make sure that the community was in, informed. Um, and I think that's our biggest, our our most important thing when we our local broadcasters is to make sure that the community is informed, the content is great, and we're taking care of them. Um, we are local people that live there. It doesn't matter who we are, we just need to make sure that the information is being disseminated out to the public so they can be prepared early on uh, during the storm and then post storm. And I don't think a lot of people in the industry, I think, uh, I think a lot of people do, but there are others that just don't understand how important it is to be really well prepared. And then the post element is just as important because you just don't know what's going to happen. I mean, it can be absolutely miserable for communities and we need to make sure that we are preparing them for what is about to come and that's making sure that there's website information social media we continue to bring up social media um, but what we did was we decided that there are five well there's six english stations but we decided to cross promote on all stations to make sure that the spanish community the hispanic community knew that they could tune into one particular product that they could go get the information and be ready for it. And we can improve as we move forward. I think we all learned some lessons along the way, and we can really do a better job. But it allowed us to be more part of that community and do what is right. Um, and doing what's right is always the key, especially when you're talking to that community. Um, we actually, Jesus was really quick. He got us, and I said in two hours, he got us the information. We immediately put him in position, and we were running them every 15 minutes. So they were very, very well informed, and we got a bunch of a bunch of stuff. And it was done via email, so it was easy for us to get it and easy to upload. Um, as we move forward, it's easier for us to continue to get them that way, or we can do it a different FTP and automatically upload them based on cart numbers, and it will just automatically go into the system. Um, we are always there. I think that's the other part that people tend to not realize is that as leaders in the community, we are on the ground. Our team is there. We are broadcasting live during the storm in a studio or cross-promoting across all stations and talking to the community via social media or any way we possibly can. We are there through the storm. 
um, I don't remember who I was speaking to, but it was somebody about taking, a, they had to get permission, it might have been you, Adam, about right. getting permission to, you know, we have credentials to go out into the market, but if we have issues with towers, we have to go make sure that we're on the air 24 seven, because that's what we do. We take chainsaws. That's right. <laughs> yes. We cut down trees. Yeah. We move stuff out of the way for the community. We make sure that we can get to the towers so we can broadcast. I mean, if we got a broadcast from a laptop, we've got mics. We're there to make sure that everybody is well informed. So it's really, really cool. Um, and like I said, we cross promoted across the stations to make sure that the community knew and could inform others um, that we were there to broadcast those particular PSAs. Um, and we could talk about as we move forward and things that we can change, but I'm sure as we continue this process and the panel and communicating together that we'll be able to, to really make a difference and really improve our products and our services to the community. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Adam. <laughs> My name's Adam Woodliff. I'm here from uh, Georgia Public Broadcasting in Atlanta, Georgia. We are a statewide uh, dual licensee. I have not, we have nine uh, television stations across the state and 18 radio stations and cover the majority of the population of, of Georgia. Um, I'm, re I'm new to Georgia, so I, I ran from the hurricanes in North Carolina and they followed us down to Georgia. They, they typically didn't have as many, but we had Michael last year, which has really made uh, this topic and, and, and just alerting in general uh, very relevant. Um, you know, we're used to thunderstorms and tornadoes and some flooding but not so much what happens when a, when a hurricane comes across and it's still 120 miles an hour and it's 50 miles inside the coastline. It's, so what we try to do, um, the serve, our, our whole goal is to serve our community. Um, when you asked earlier, how do we find out what we need to do or what is it we want to do, you know, we, we reach out to the community. I, I mean, I, since I'm new to the state, I've done some stuff. I mean, we have a, I had to write this down, I apologize, but um, we have 926,000 uh, Spanish speaking residents in Georgia. Um, so Georgia is unique in a lot of ways, but Atlanta especially, and you know, we have nine and a half million people in the state of Georgia, but two thirds of them live in a 45 mile radius. And the rest of it down in Savannah and Aaron's area, I mean, that's five hours from, four and a half, five hours from Atlanta. So the population is dispersed, which means that sometimes the commercial reach from a local standpoint isn't there. There's a lot of folks between Atlanta and Savannah that sometimes we, you know, we are the only local source. So what we try to do um, is have a public-private partnership. Aaron and I were just talking today about how some of the things he's doing in Savannah, we can capitalize on that to help serve the communities even better because he's got six radio stations in that area, I have three. So between us, we can really cover the area, whether it be a Spanish-speaking population or English. We, the, the, the point is to disseminate the information as much as and get it out there as much as possible. It doesn't matter that we're overlapping or what we're doing. The point is to get it out. The other thing that we try to do, uh, and I'll get to the bilingual part here in a second, but we also work very closely with GEMA. We are a state authority, so we are part of state government, and that gives us it's, it's, a, it's a good thing, especially when it comes to the emergency management groups. Um, we work directly at the state headquarters, and then just this week, uh, we have 159 counties in Georgia, and they are divided up into different emergency operation centers regionally. I just had a conversation with the ones that border Florida. There's a nine county group down there and they want us to come and speak and, and figure out how we can help them serve their community better. And I, I think that's the point of how you figure out what you're, you wanna do, is you let your community tell you what's needed. In North Carolina, when, when I was there and Fred and I were working there, we didn't go out and jam something down the emergency operators. You know, we, wanted, we went and explained to them what we could do, they told us what their problems were, and then we met in the middle and were able to serve better. Because I am not an emergency responder, I'm a broadcaster. Um, we talked about the trustworthy. I hear that come up a lot. One of the things that I think is an advantage of being a public broadcaster with television and in my case now with radio is some of that trust is already built in. So what we try to do um, and what we're working on 
is when we talk about these social medias and things, we have a lot of Twitter followers and a lot of that follow GPB as a whole. So when it comes time to emergency, we pick, we team up with the state agencies and re, we retweet their information that they're putting out for everybody to have. We put that on our Facebook pages, our social media pages to try to help overcome that the the misinformation because you know you can trust us and then if we're sort of putting that forward and we're, we're very we're very good about that and then of course now what we're trying to do is build a website a depository a repository of information that has things from say errand stations it, it comes from the local and county emergency operations centers to where all of that is in one spot we're just trying to get the information out there we do have news and we, we do that as well but if I can get you to one spot and you can say oh well, I'm in Henry County, but I'm in Fulton. How does this, you know, all that information is in one spot and we can go. And when it comes to the bilingual, that's where that comes into play. The, um, what we've been looking to do with the radio portion is what we're dipping our toe into and, and investigating right now. We do read the alerts, the emergency alerts that come from the governor, the statements. They, you know, we sometimes take them live, but a lot of times we have the copy and we have the ability to, it may take longer, but we have the ability to translate it. And that's that's what we're going to start trying to do is especially when it comes to evacuations and and things like that that's what we're going to try to focus on first to try to get involved in that because the other responsibility we have as the public broadcaster is that we also if you ride down i-20 or 75 north you'll notice the hurricane evacuation routes and every one of them say georgia public broadcasting so they take over our air signals in order to um, get that information out and I think it's important to start working to figure out how to do that in uh, you know a multilingual platform we've had some conversations with the Georgia Association of Broadcasters that's moving along pretty well and and they're interested in this and we're just trying to figure out a way we don't necessarily we don't want to be the heroes we just want to get it out there and try to help the folks um, another thing that I do want to mention, I've got to get my plugs in and then Take we can in. move on, um, is Dana Golub is, is here and we keep talking about WIA. Um, well, let's don't forget about WARN. Um, does everybody know what PBS WARN is? And that is the Warning Alert Response Network. So that is the backup to the cellular uh, WIAs. When those messages go out, they are also delivered over the PBS satellite network and then retransmitted through Fred and, and myself and all the um, system stations across the country to make sure that those messages get there. So we're, we're key in trying to figure out diverse ways to get information out. I think as public broadcasters, we sit in a pretty good position to have a, a, a good relationship with a commercial entity, and that's what we really are trying to do. Um, it's, when it comes to these events especially, there's, not, there's no competition with getting this information out. Um, you know, you may want your weather to be heard more than someone else, but the main thing is to work together to get this information out. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is great. We have we have we have a fair amount of time, and what I think would be good to do between yeah. David, David and I can tag team off each other um, uh, would be to drill down a little bit <clears throat> into some of the more specifics of what each of you has done in, in particular situations. So I think in, in, that this would be really helpful to the to the folks who are participating uh, over 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 the uh, the live stream who are on, who may be from various states, of the local city government. Uh, who, who want to begin to think about, well, what can I do? What kind of particular guidelines can I put in place for my state if I don't really have anything going? So John, I want to start with you. Uh, and uh, one of the things that, that, and I'm particularly in how you and Lillian, and I see Ed Zarnicki in the audience here from Monroe Electronics, were able to set up the relationship between the uh, uh, Emergency Operations Center and ultimately the broadcasters to make sure that if you're sending out letter of, of, of alerts in, in English, Somali, Spanish, and Hmong, that the appropriate stations at the edge have their, have their equipment set up to be able to actually receive those and deliver them. What, what, what was involved with that? I don't mean question. to put you on the spot. Uh, no, no, actually uh, back in 2013, I was the communications officer for the Homeland Security Emergency Management Division of the state of Minnesota. So uh, with that, the, uh, the job duties there, I mean, we had a very good relationship with TPT on the, on the onset. 
Then when we saw this grant came come in from the uh, or be advertised from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, you know, we really looked at that and uh, uh, person who, who uh, of interest on that one was a man by the name of Don Heppelman. He was uh, worked at, with Lillian before and myself quite a bit. Uh, Don has probably taught me everything I know about EES and then some. With that, he is he was our former chair, and uh, Don goes. We're not doing this in multiple languages. Why? Why can't we try this? And so, uh, with that, they applied for it. And like I say, the, the biggest thing is is the grant funding got us to the point that we're at right now. I think the biggest challenge that we're having right now is keeping that momentum going. Uh, like anything, emergency management, uh, public broadcasting, all that. It all takes money. It all takes time. It all takes dedication. The biggest thing is that we have in Minnesota is we have a large group of dedicated people working on these things that are really, really tied into this. Uh, but you know, your job duties get take you away for a lot of other things. But I think the big thing is is getting that outreach. Like I said before, going out to the broadcasters who want to do this and tell them honestly what's the work involved, because. A lot of them will say they hate or raise their hand. We would like to do this, but is it going to involve upgrading their equipment? Is it going to involve, you know, a lot of engineering time, you know, to get it set up and to get it running? That's the big challenge right there. And I mean, that's where, you know, the grant program is 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 needed, you know, just to get these folks up and running so we can serve our, our uh, other English-speaking populations. Okay, so did you work individually with broadcasters, or did you work with the State Broadcast Association, or, you know, without getting too deep into the into the depths of, of EAS with the with the state emergency communication committees, to to try to get stations to to do those things? Yes, our broadcasters association is very well tied into us. Uh, in fact, we went through when the, some of the original portions started coming out, how do we get messages out in Spanish? They identified the Spanish-speaking stations for us, and we did some testing with those uh, stations, and we've gone through and really worked well with that. And like I say, the Hmong and the Somali portion, that's going to take some extra time, effort, and above all, money to get, to get it put in place. Okay, thank you. Hi, John. I wanted to uh, just uh, ask a little bit about um, the ecosystem. So you've got a station, uh, a channel uh, on a public television that's dedicated to delivering <coughs> alert information and weather information, other information. Um, and I just wanted, if you, just, just to talk about how the um, the PSAs and outreach ties in ties into that. So you've got you guys were issuing PSAs in different languages. Um, for these, for, for the Hmong population and, and the Spanish population, and uh, I forget the other Somali, uh, and then Somali population. So you were got, were you guys doing PSAs in those languages to reach those folks, and that the purpose of that was to uh, inform those f folks that they could turn to this channel, and then you and then when you go to that channel, that's where you will have the the banner information. You, you'll run the EAS content in those languages. Is that kind of it's kind of like an ecosystem of how do you reach out to these folks and and how do you get the information to them? Uh, is that more or less how that works, or? Exactly. Channel 2.5, the uh, TPT now, has been the for the past couple of years working with the local emergency managers of Region 6, which is our metropolitan region, working with the Department of Public Safety, and above all, Lily McDonald going out there with uh, with her dedication and really pushing. You know, to work with the communities and getting those PSAs out there, uh, I think that's a it's a wonderful opportunity for us. Uh, just recently, we have started partnering up at the our office of communication, and Lillian have been producing graphics in those multiple languages that we can use. Like I say before, we are using those through our broadcasters association, our cable, and anybody else that has a. Uh, website out there, and if they have a presence on social media, those graphics are made for social media so that they can put those out there as a preparedness information. Thank you, thank you. Um, 
So, Jesus, let me ask you, I think, and Dave, I might pass this question off to you because David said that you had two particular stories to tell, the one in, in Miami and then others, what, how, how you deal with things on the ground during, during an emergency, if you wanted to expand on that a little a bit. Absolutely. We, we, we hyper-focus on the local communities, and when we find out there's a storm coming, we immediately implement and activate our emergency disaster system, procedures that we have in place. We link up all of our stations in Miami. We have three radio stations in Miami plus Mega TV, TV network. And we start giving the broadcasts in Spanish, of course, all of the updates every 15 minutes. As we get closer to the storm, it depends on the warning or if it's um, just an alert, then we go completely 100% linked up all the stations at the same time broadcasting with our team. We have two teams that stay in-house at the radio station with, you know, of course, food, water, everything that they may need because we don't know to the extent of the damage and disaster after the fact and how long they're going to be at the radio station. We immediately start broadcasting. We have a couple of journalists. We have um, on-air talents that stay at the station and broadcast continuously 24-7, nonstop. They take different shifts, so eight on, eight off, and they rest. and. And that's the way we have been on air for the last, all the, all the hurricanes have come by through uh, Florida, whether it be a direct hit or not. Um, in Puerto Rico, the same. We coordinate with our multi-markets, with our talents all across the board in New York, in Puerto Rico, Miami, and LA. The stories that we have, I mean, I remember when I was a little kid, and uh, well, I don't want to give away my age yet, but. Hurricane Andrew back in the day and before oh, that, boy. you know, it, it was terrible. But all uh, I would I remember listening to the radio station. I had a little radio listening to what was going on and, and pretty much calmed my parents down because they didn't speak English. My parents immigrated, uh, they worked three jobs, and I was the one translating, you know, hey, you know, it's going to be over soon. And that's when I realized, hey, I want to be in radio. <laughs> you know, that's, I want to be able to do this and be cool like that and mm -hmm. I was uh, I love the radio guys and all the information and then later in life I was able to meet them and work with them so that was that was a cool thing sure thank you Th those uh, th those stations are in Miami are part of um, a, a little EAS network uh, are they not so if it's not just hurricanes, I mean, if you get a, uh, a some kind of a, a flood flooding uh, EAS alert those alerts are passed through those five Span Spanish language stations in Miami. Is that right? And they're just kind of contained within those stations in that market. We, we get the alerts from in English, actually. And then what we do immediately is we do live translation of it. I mean, we just pick it up and broadcast it and take ownership of it on our network. Um, and that's something that we would like to propose is not only send the alert in, in, in English, also have uh, a Spanish version of it, uh, be it a quick one, and that would be very helpful. All right, and but just so, so this, the, so the you, when you're broadcasting it, your alert in Spanish, your station is being monitored by another Spanish language station, you know, correct? And, and so, correct. and they'll just rebroadcast that. They're not going to read that you've already translated it, and but that way you've kind of you've spread the the alert information out through a few different stations. Uh, and through your monitoring assignments, uh, you've, you've all kind of um, been able to shape where that message goes and to limit it so that it doesn't go somewhere it doesn't need to go at the same time. Is that, is that kind of how you guys have it? We definitely share and link. Uh, at that moment, there is no, no competitors. We're all one voice for the public safety. So it doesn't matter if we're competing for ratings. It, it really doesn't matter at that point. We, we share all the information together and, and all the broadcast materials that we have are pretty much shared among all of our stations and competitive stations as well. It doesn't really matter. Okay. Um, let me just follow up with one. I've got, uh, I think Katrina was a big example for all of us where, where, where stations were knocked off the air and, uh, and, and certain, po although the populations were reached, but certain stations were, were, were no longer available. How, particularly, I, uh, when we're talking about broadcast, if we're talking about radio uh, and TV, how have, and I'm, I'm opening this up to anybody on the uh, panel, how, um, how do you coordinate among this group to make sure that no voices are lost? 
how would you coordinate, for example, if Station X is off the air, and that might be the only Spanish or the only Hmong or the only Somali station, you want to make sure that you give that, that person a voice. How, how have you, particularly in any of the hurricanes that have happened, try to coordinate amongst yourselves to, to make sure that no voices are lost? Well, in our case, we try to stay on air. We've luckily been able to remain on air. Our competitors have also been able to stay on air, remain on air as uh, FM and AM stations. Uh, in, in, in the case of Puerto Rico, we also remained on air, and a lot of the other stations um, were not able to uh, remain on air. But we definitely uh, had the talents from other radio stations come over if they were uh, able to do it safely to participate on air with us and, and help us out because at that time everybody needs to help each other. So that's how we work together in, in that point because we don't know if a station is going to go off air until it happens. You know? and, and then at that point, what is it that you do? Sometimes phone services, uh, in, in particular the last hurricanes, my cell phone service went out immediately. I had no internet, I had no TV, I had the radio and I had a satellite phone, which was very helpful. And that's what we used in, in Puerto Rico when we landed. Uh, and, and in those instances, we make sure we have all of those materials and items for the emergency to continue the communication. You know, CB radios also, also work very well for our communication among uh, our stations and other stations in the market. So if we're off air or any other station is off air, and if any of our talent can make it, then that we definitely work together to make it happen. We just want to get the public safety we want to get all the information that's coming to us and, and pretty much keep the calm. You know, when you hear a voice, give, you know, speaking to you, talking with you, connecting with you, uh, it, it pretty much keeps people calm and avoids any type of panic, which is pretty much the cause of a, a lot of issues and people heading out before the storm is over, getting, you know, stepping on a, a bad puddle of water with some electricity. You know, those are the things that, that are avoidable. It's the post, the post, uh, Disaster that's really important because that's when people start venturing out and and getting hurt You know more people get hurt after the storm than during the, than during the storm And that's that's the reason why we are working together and making sure we learn a lot from every every occasion that these things happen They're going to continue to happen and it's you know, it could be an earthquake tomorrow. It could be man-made um, disaster that's always a possibility and we always have to be ready for it and we're all working together like I said there's no competitor there is no station that <coughs> will not work together to uh, have this public safety. Okay. One Please. Of the, uh, one of the things we're doing in North Carolina with the state emergency operations folks um, is that we're going to have a seat at the table now at the emergency operations center, uh, which is something we haven't had in the past. Um, uh, the state wireless interoperability coordinator, the SWIC, I got to get this. <laughs> I have a lot of acronyms. Um, um, you know, he has a spot in his office where I'm going to be sitting, um, and ho hopefully I'll get some other volunteers to do this. Uh, but we will be uh, fielding calls from the broadcast community um, who are affected uh, or going to be affected by, you know, um, um, fuel issues, power issues, uh, whatever type of uh, uh, issues that will come up that perhaps the National Guard or others could uh, help. Alleviate. So one of the problems we had with Hurricane Florence were a number of broadcasters at the transmission sites. Uh, they went to generator. The roads became impassable. They ran out of fuel. They were off the air. Um, the, you know, the, the EOC recognizes that every broadcaster, you know, is, is a vital piece of the communication network uh, during one of these events. So um, as far as if a station were to, you know, uh, Let's say they had a flooded studio. That was a, one of the concerns in one of the um, uh, communities. That's where the, the uh, State Broadcast Association, their members will work together to try to, to come up some sort of shared uh, opportunity for those folks to work together. But uh, f you know, for me, uh, it's more the, the technical and the uh, infrastructure side. You know, we're, we're you know we're going to work together to uh, provide some means of relief for all. But then if you're saying, if you're saying that, that, that at the SWIC that you have a seat at the table and that the broadcasters can call you if, for example, yes, yes know, I'm sorry, actually, yeah. then that really, it, you know, have making sure that the Spanish, if you could reference the Spanish language station, really you become the central hub yes. of that information. Yes, yeah. It's great, it's great, thank you. Um, yeah, please, Eric. I'd like to add to that just for a second. I mean, Jesus said there's no competition, and there really isn't when there's something like this going on. I mean, we all love a friendly 
competitor. We like to compete. It's just <laughs> what we do. Um, but even the engineers, um, every engineer for every competitor, they have a plan, and we all create a plan together to make sure that they're communicating from tower site A to tower site B, and we have priority radio stations in the market that we want to keep on the air based on signal strength. Um, the bigger the signal, the better reach it's going to have, so we want to make sure that those are continuously on air. We want to keep everybody on air, but we, we definitely tier those stations. Um, from there, as far as the communication side, and I've, I've already stated that there is not a Hispanic radio station in that market, so it's going to be a, it'll be an interesting day when we all look at each other and figure out how we're going to move forward to try and communicate all the information we can because we really are the one in our company that's going to supply the market at this point because we believe it's necessary. But that's all we have to continue to make sure that those people are communicated with. Now, I do believe websites and cell phone access and all that type of stuff is really important. Even you already mentioned the FM chip. We could go down that road all day long. But it's pretty cool to, to have that conversation um, and really work together as a community, as, as broadcasters, to really make sure that our stations are going to stay on the air and everybody has their responsibilities. Thank on the you. emergency management side, I got to tell you that this is something that we see on, on a very regular basis, and, and, and that's something that, that, that we value greatly is, is how the media works together on that. So, uh, one of the couple of floods before Harvey, we had one of our, our NBC station that, that went out um, and had to broadcast uh, uh, via Facebook and, and do Facebook Live, and you would see reporters from other stations saying, "Hey, we know Channel Two's down. If you're trying to follow them, in case you don't know, they're broadcasting on on Facebook, or you're doing this." Um, during Harvey, we had the CBS station that they got flooded. Uh, PBS created home for them literally within about a day, day and a half, and they were um, uh, slowly be able to get back and, and provide information like that. And I think they housed them for about a year. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> so uh, made a quick roommate there, but now they've got a new facility. So we've seen that at the local level uh, in emergency management. That's something that we, that we value greatly. And from our side, one of the things that we've identified is, is a, uh, we recognize them as critical infrastructure. Uh, that's, that's an essential partner for us to be able to inform and keep the public safe. Um, one of the things that, that, that we've got sort of in, in our strategic plan on the communication side is how do we integrate them into the planning process as critical infrastructure, not just recognize them as that, but um, uh, how, how do we make sure that, that, that we have that awareness of what's happening, uh, be able to uh, to expedite anything that they might need. Um, so that's something that's on, our, that's on our plate to do as well. Okay, thank you. Let me kind of follow up on that, because I'm thinking about a panel you and I did for LULAC about a year ago. Right. And um, there you really took those folks who were very much like IAC. They are local, they were the Hispanic officials, but they're local government officials. You took them through the whole process. And if let's say you're in the governor's office and you might not be terribly familiar with the Office of Emergency Management, but nonetheless you want to know, well, how do we, prepare, you know, from setting up an operations center to just making sure that you're connected to the right folks to get that alert out, what advice would you give that guy or that woman? So when it comes to multilingual alerting particularly, I, I would say uh, it is a daunting challenge for a jurisdiction even like Harris County. Um, so any size jurisdiction needs to tackle it though, and I would say find ways to, 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 to make it workable and, and, and figure out that, that strategy forward. One of the things that we're doing right now that can be re replicated anywhere, the challenge is providing multilingual information in real time, because typically someone has to translate it. We don't trust the, the, the automatic translations. There's challenges to that. Um, and even when we throw a, a significant number of people to be able to get that information out, it's first written in English, by and large, and you have to translate it. So we, we're minimizing the delay. So one of the things we're doing now is, for lack of a better term, is creating just-in-time PSAs for the hazards uh, that we are most likely to face. So at the very least, uh, we're working with uh, DefLink, a, 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 a partner in Texas that, that does some work in this space. And so we're going to provide uh, a, them scripts for the 15 most likely hazards that we will face. Flooding, turn around, don't drown, tornadoes, wildfires, chemical incidents, and the basic preparedness messages. It's not necessarily going to be the you know what to do right now in the moment, but things that will keep that in, 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 uh, safe. And in a multimedia way, we'll address English, Spanish language, and deaf and hard of hearing through ASL. Um, and so in the moment, we will post that up, so at least we will have a resource so people know what to do to, to stay safe, and we can do that. Um, to cut down on the time, one of the things that uh, um, uh, we would like to be doing in the near future um, is 
is looking at outside partners that can do that for us uh, more expeditiously. So yes, we will have people in-house uh, that will be translating information for us in Spanish, uh, uh, but we want to reduce the, the, the lag time. So uh, we, what we hope to do in the near future is be able to have a our, our, our alert or information go to a partner that can, has this capability that then can translate that from English in almost real time in ASL and in Spanish. And the benefit of this, so you'll still have a delay, but it's almost instantaneous, literally about 15, 20 minutes. But in the end, I think the great value of that, aside from getting the job done, is they are now in multimedia format. And when you look at where the future is going for alerts and warnings, people want information in multimedia. So we'll be providing information in English, in text, but if you're providing in Spanish and ASL, we'll be in multimedia, which is much more appealing, much more engaging, and which people will, will, will do more. So um, that's one thing they can do, and definitely the pre-staging of messages, I, I think, is critically important as well. Those, those are, uh, at least that first step is something I think uh, uh, should be able, uh, th that is low-hanging fruit, to have those pre-scripted messages in, in multiple languages, not just Spanish and ASL, but um, for those that are respective to your community, that at least gets you um, the preparedness information that, that you might need at the local level. Now, this is also, just to tune back to what Matt Gerst was talking about in the prior panel, uh, the, all of that information is information that could be that that could be linked to a to a wireless emergency alert if you issued the wireless emergency alert. Am I correct? Yeah, and now that you've got the link capability yeah. on there, we we we, we can do that. Uh, uh, and that'd be beneficial. So that 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 segues into iPause, and you can do that across multiple platforms. So please. So some of the stuff that we like the links, and we we're talking about for the wireless alerts. This, um, one of our new friends that's around the corner is also Next Gen TV, which is ATSC 3.0. Thank you. I was hoping we could talk. So about that. all of these things that uh, we've talked about that that can work concurrently with wireless. I'm glad that we keep using the words not competitive because we're not. As a public broadcaster or broadcaster, I'm not competing with 5G. I'm not competing with wireless. We're just trying to get this information out there. So a lot of these tools can be cross-platform now to where they were not able to do that as easily before. But again, that goes back into we have to keep one another informed. The, the broadcasters have to get down to the, you know, we do television, we do radio, we do multimedia, you do emergency management planning. So when we're able to communicate our needs and, and the availability of, of products and tools and technologies and, and get in a room together and sit down, then we can really go somewhere versus just saying, hey, I can do this, now go do it. You know, um, it just never works. That I mean, you could get off a little, uh, uh, rocky start, but when you're able to really communicate and get going, some of the programs we worked on in North Carolina started that way. You know, we don't have a way to, for many people to listen to our uh, Viper radio system. We're tying up bandwidth. Well, hey, why don't we break it off and put some, you know, into our television spectrum and then free that up. And then that just keeps all the conversations rolling. And you were talking earlier about the, um, the infrastructure and things. One of the things that we, we haven't said a lot, I know it's true with commercial and public, not only on our tower sites, it's not just our antennas and our equipment in those buildings. Um, I know in my case, I mean, I've got NOAA radios everywhere. We have uh, national, the National Weather Service. I've got the FBI. I've got GEMA. You've got forestry. You've got all these people that are living in these buildings and, and sharing your towers. And that's why the stuff that like Fred is working on is, is so important because People don't sometimes they don't realize that because you know people change jobs and all this stuff is oh remember and they don't even know that you have that so by being able to tell your emergency management people hey don't forget you're using my generator to keep your two way radio system running over on this site when the tree falls down and, and which happened in, in one of our cases we were able to call GEMA and say hey I can't get through there and they redirected the road crews to clear the road so that our engineers could get into the site and, and not only put us back, but also get the critical communications for the community back on the air. And I know that doesn't really touch directly on the multilingual, but it, it, it could. I mean, it's all part of the piece of getting that information out there, because if we can't get the information out there, we don't have anything to translate. Mm -hmm. So making sure that those partnerships and that communication are there are really key. 
Um, one of the things that, that we have the honor of doing in Georgia is we house the Georgia Radio Reading Service, which is for the blind. And what we learned during uh, Hurricane Michael was that they actually took the emergency alerts and the information that we were putting out and not only broadcast them out over their over-the-air reception, but they're really big on their um, streaming and broadband service. That was relayed that way as well. So we were able to reach uh, that community in several ways, and that's where one of these translated um, alerts could come into, into play as well by having that provided on that service, and that serves an entirely different community as well. So I think the big thing is we're all in this, it's like this giant spider web, and we just have to figure out how to connect all the dots and, and, and make it work. This is, this is great. Thank you. I mean, is there, just before we move on with questions from the audience, are there any other, again, open to the panel, advice that you would give to, to, um, to government officials on, on how to take advantage of some of the resources that, 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 that all of you provide? And I realize you're wearing, you can wear both hats. Uh, uh, John, but uh, but a lot of the other folks are, are in the broadcast. But how do you how do you get your government officials tuned into all of these great resources? I just okay. ask and invite yeah. us to these meetings. Um, you know, like the one I was. I mean, invite us to the communication planning meetings and you know call the station. Somebody will redirect you to get to the people you need to have at these meetings. I think there's 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 an important part of this. You know, for public broadcasting, and I'm not I'm not I'm, I'm not. This is not critical of any commercial broadcasters, but for public broadcasters, you know, we have, we have a sense of there's a sense of trust uh, that we've developed, and uh, you know, for us, we, we we have a public safety uh, working group, uh, part of the public uh, uh, TV engineering community, and you know, one of the things that we've been working on is to improve the messaging to the public safety right. community to, uh, that hey, we're there, we're here to help you. Um, we're not going to tell you what to do, but, but, but we can help get the message out. In English, in Spanish, in, in other um, in other languages, in other in other ways that perhaps they're not aware of, and so uh, you know that's a that's a key piece. Is it's a trust and communication, like Adam talked about. Thank you. I, I got one more thing to add. I sure, think please. you can see that the relationships and the even just the quick time that we've all been sitting up here, we do work very well together, and the non-competition thing continues to come up, but we really are. Um, we're we're working together, and with just Jesus and ours and our my, you know, our partnership, it's the beginning of something really cool that I think could be something great for the future. But I think as a local broadcaster, letting us do what we do, um, you know, we we love being able to broadcast and help the community. But the the advice that I would give is just let us continue to do what we're doing, and you know, let us work together and see what we can develop as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? I'm sorry you had to walk that far. Uh, Monty Taylor, Communications <coughs> Daily. I just wondered, you guys are all describing uh, programs that you came up with or, or you know, collectively came up with locally in your locations. Do you think there should be or would it be helpful to you to have more federal encouragement for this sort of thing, uh, FCC regulations or some sort of FEMA participation? Do you wish that there was more federal efforts on multilingual alerting, or is this local system working? I'm glad to tackle the question. Sure, so, please. So, so, so yeah. one, I think uh, uh, a couple of things. I think one of the, uh, from my experience in sort of uh, in being engaged in the dialogue on the process, you know, through CISRIC and some other things, what, what really works well is bringing all those multiple stakeholders to the table with different perspectives and, and coming on some consensus paths forward to be able to do that. Um, and uh, as a local emergency manager, you would think I'd say, yes, we ought to require this and require that and, and do this. But here's the challenge that I found. There's part of these challenge, part of the, there's the social science side and there's the technology side. And what uh, the concern that I have lately um, is actually requiring certain things within certain parameters as opposed to um, inspiring innovation and, and things that, 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 that move towards moving to innovation forward. I'm finding that 
setting very specific parameters sometimes restrains the pace at which technology and collaboration at the local level can actually move the ball forward quicker. Um, so I think you've got to find the right balance. Um, and, and so I think that's one of the things we have to grapple with. I, th I think there's a role to encourage it, uh, motivate it, uh, nudge it along, um, and, and, on the and on the requirement side, I think you, you have to walk a fine balance of not putting yourself in a box when the pace of innovation and technology can, if you harness that, can probably move you quicker um, than being defined to only play within a certain, uh, a certain rule set. Please, John. I think one of the things that the, and I, I agree totally with what uh, Francisco is saying, the big portion of this is getting the conversation rolling. One of the things that I teach in my public safety uh, courses is talking to the folks that are there. And when we're doing testing to start working with the broadcaster, get that relationship going. A disaster is no place to start to start exchanging cards. You know, getting that going to the fact that what can the broadcaster do for you to be a first informer? I think that's the, uh, that's the big thing. Sure, the, the doorbell gets hit when we hit that uh, wheel alert or a EES or anything else that we should send out through IPOS because that's really the only way the local has got is through the IPOS access or through their local alerting system, which really uh, is poorly subscribed to nationwide on that. It's just a fact of life. But I think the big thing is, is once you hit that button and you've knocked on the door, be prepared for the media to come in and be able to start asking you some questions. I think it was very good. You were talking about the translations. They didn't have time to sit there and think about the questions and all that. And realistically, that's what needs to be done. Get this conversation rolling, I think, on a national level. This is a great place to start. But I think the next step is go to the associations. Get some session time at, like, NAB. They have a, a, uh, a EES roundtable every once in a while here in D.C. Get this conversation rolling in front of the broadcasters for the ones that are going, oh, I think we could do that. You know, just to get that idea going. A lot, to, a lot of times it just takes a, a couple times for people to hear it and then the light bulb goes off. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David Honig with MMTC. The, the existential question that is posed by this is what happens when nobody volunteers? I was really moved by Jesus and Alan, the Dick's company, uh, Aaron Wilborn's statements of really how this can work and how well-meaning volunteers can come together and work together and the, 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 the anguish that's felt in hearing this wonderful testimony is that for every market where this works and really can work pretty easily, there are two or three where it hasn't worked. Where the data dump that came in after um, the court case found that the vast majority of states have no plan, have no volunteers. That's what we don't see. Most of us certainly would rather that if there were an emergency and it was in our neighborhood, that we not rely just on volunteers to take our families to the hospital. That we not rely on a volunteer police force, a volunteer army. Yes, that it would be good to have volunteers who'd help us, but at some point that we have a backup system um, of professionals. And what's useful and what's really great about today's event is that it underscores that this is not hard. This is not as hard as it's been made out to be. This can be made to work. Um, this is within the realm of the possible. Any rules can be developed with, um, based on this experience, that it can be done in a way that's not intrusive, and that we, t five years later, if this were done, we would look back on this and say, this really wasn't that hard, and we've done something that benefits everyone irrespective of what language they were brought up in. And that's the spirit in which we ought to look at this. So I certainly want to commend the commission for pulling together this wonderful session, having the top line witnesses in the country to come in and testify to this, and just hope that everyone would look at this from the standpoint of what would I want for my family if it were hit by an emergency. Thank you. Any, any response? Okay. Um, I think we have one question over here.
I'm Tony Perhogen. I'm with the uh, Chester County Department of Emergency Services in Westchester, Pennsylvania, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, quick question for John on the uh, nuclear uh, testing. Did you actually do live testing uh, during your exercise or did you go to the lab? I've been working with WIA and we, all our messages are going to the lab for verification, uh, not going out live. For the nuclear power plant testing, we've always done that through the laboratory. Okay. The, uh, it's been very well received. Uh, the FEMA evaluation team that uh, has come out and saw the first one when we sent it out. Uh, we did the uh, webinar with the lab so that they were able to see the tools, the phone shaking on the table with the message going across, being able to see how it looked at a cable system, a television system, you know, and be able to hear how it would come out on, on radio. Because one of the things that we're, we're really into is the text-to-speech portion of it, you know, and, and how that works. We've done it several times now, and that's basically a check off that we do each year, but we have not done a live one yet. Um, if, if I may, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the um, and I can't remember the, the names of the folks offhand, but the folks who run the nuclear power uh, uh, process for the state of Virginia applied for waivers to do two tests of the wireless emergency alert system as part of the error. So we granted those. And so we've had at least one and perhaps two WIA tests that were conducted in conjunction with the siren tests of the regular nuclear power plant tests, and they were quite successful. So uh, that we have an ongoing relationship, uh, Public Safety Bureau does, with the, with the portion of FEMA, and Al, I can't recall the name of it off, offhand, the portion of FEMA that, that deals with the nuclear power plants and, 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 and with their uh, alert and warning obligations. Radiological emergency preparedness. Exactly. Thank you. What, <laughs> what, what uh, he said. And yeah. make sure that you say test. We had an we, incident yeah. a <laughs> couple of weeks it, ago yeah. in Georgia. We had 50 people calling. Or should we run? Like, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> so. and, that, and that works. Uh, you know, the we have parts were working for us, but used for route alerting now instead of having to send out the uh, volunteer fire departments and things like that. As far as Harris County is concerned, uh, you're working with your local um, radio station, radio and TV stations. Uh, Chester County, we're affiliated with the Philly uh, market. Would we work with the uh, Philly market uh, to get that information out um, if or something happening in Chester County? Uh, even though we really don't have any um, uh, pu you know, public stations within Chester County, maybe from the colleges or something like that. Yeah, no, definitely uh, sort of, uh, you'd work within your media market uh, and, and, and sort of, and, and I would even say that sort of you have to work in, 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 in sort of uh, just the general area, even, even outside of that. Uh, and I would get in, uh, plugged into your, uh, the, the state emergency communications committees are great, but also you know, there's a local emergency communications committee. Um, and, and so sort of be engaged in that, know those players and start building those relationships that way. Um, we've got actually the co-chair of ours is, is, is a, we, we co-chair that with, uh, 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 with someone from the media, Houston Public Media, helps court share that with us and we make sure that all the, uh, all the folks uh, 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 there have a seat. So um, when it comes to that, I was definitely engaged with that media market and because you, you, uh, and for us, we even sort of, we have the benefit where the 10th largest media market has got, it's got quite, a big foot, quite a big footprint, um, but we learned during Hurricane Ike to also be very cognizant of the media markets that are not us, for example, in South Texas, and those immediately to, to, to our north and northeast. Because when power goes out, it doesn't matter if you're broadcasting. <laughs> we can't consume the information. Right. And what we found that sort of uh, um, uh, that uh, people are relying on media markets to around us to get that information. So I would sort of just expand those relationships beyond your space. And then you just never know. You know my job is to be paranoid as an emergency manager. I, I never know if the threat's coming that way, that way, or this way, from this way. We ought to assume it's coming from everywhere. So um, uh, that's the only advice I would have in, in that regard. And we, and we deal with uh, Maryland and Delaware close by as far as our states, uh, our, actually our county and, and the state of uh, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So yeah. yes, we would have to co-mingle yeah. co with those. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And I think I, I don't think we have any questions online, so I think that I think we timed this out just just perfectly. So so thanks to this. This is a really great panel. Thank you, thank you very very much. This is super helpful information. Um, we are now on lunch, and we'll see you all back at uh, one o'clock. Thank you.
And just so you know, the up on courtyard is is the uh, is the is the cafeteria, and there's certainly the wharf. If you don't mind, a hundred degree temperature. Yeah. And uh, just to remind you, if you, if you when you go out to come, you have to uh, check back in through security because they have to you know check you again. It's it's a headache, I know, but hey, just John, this was a, this was great, man. Thank you very much. Uh, hey everybody, how you doing? Let's get this uh, show on the road here. Um, so this is our third and uh, last panel, and uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank all you guys for coming out and uh, volunteering your time to do this. It's a uh, real helpful, and uh, you know, there's been a lot of great information. I think that's come out of this workshop so far. Um, this panel is going to focus on technology. Uh, what, what, what kind of multilingual capabilities are available in current technologies and then kind of on the horizon, um, what, what may be coming, uh, what may be available through uh, uh, newer technologies that are, um, you know, not too far from deployment. So uh, we've got uh, Ed Zarnicki from uh, Digital Alert Systems, Inc., Brian Tulin from Everbridge, uh, Brian Daly from AT&T, um, Ashruf, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to butcher another second name uh, today, so um, I'm just going to, let me see if I have his, Eldenary. what's that? Eldenary, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm real bad with names if you hadn't figured that out yet. Uh, from Exbury Corporation, um, Pat, uh, wait a second, where's this again? Where's Pat for you? Feldhausen. I'm sorry, what's that? Feldhausen. Feldhausen, okay. Uh, from um, uh, which representative? Look at the thing. I'm way, I'm way out of way. <laughs> like, my materials are missing here. Like somebody, somebody I hope I didn't lifted, steal them. Yeah, somebody lifted my. Uh, there you stuff go. Here. I, I had it, but now I don't have it. This is a bad start to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry about there it. We'll, we'll get them going. Here you go. At the bottom there. of that page, beginning of the next page. All right. Sorry about that, folks. My uh, materials got. Uh, Moved on here. Oh, that's right. Okay, all right. Offering manager from the weather company uh, and IBM Business, and Harold Price from Sage. Um, so, Ed, uh, we were going to follow the same format from the other panels. Uh, if you get good guys, could speak like five to seven minutes uh, about your the multilingual uh, elements of, of your technologies, and then we'll follow up with questions. So, Ed, take it away. Great. Thank you, Dave. Greg, thank you for putting together this very valuable workshop, and you really did assemble a very, very uh, powerful range of, of, of speakers here. I want to thank you for doing this. Uh, my name again is Ed Zarnicki with Digital Alert Systems. Um, we are probably best known at, for providing emergency alert system equipment for uh, television, radio, and cable systems. Uh, very, very uh, strong presence in the video provider space. Uh, we also provide emergency operations center solutions uh, for uh, for interfacing with IPAWS and and, and the uh, and the uh, uh, conventional EAS system. I just lost my notes. I think is it Friday the 13th? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, w as I said, we've got a, a, a very strong presence in the video provider sp space. Um, given given uh, our our, our market penetration, we, we see this role as giving us a particular responsibility or commitment uh, towards uh, maintaining and, and, and even advancing the capabilities of public warning systems in the country. Uh, we tend to be rather forward-looking in our, in, our, in our group, uh, focusing on advanced standards, advanced technologies, and, and one of those areas of, of work uh, has been in multilingual, uh, where I think we've done some, some pioneering efforts, at least on a pilot basis. Um, we'll, we'll delve into a little bit about that. Um, my particular portfolio in the company uh, covers both public sector and international, and multilingual is an, an interesting area where both those areas converge, and we've brought some of that experience into the U.S. market from overseas. Uh, in Canada, we've uh, provided uh, um, bilingual sis, uh, uh, support in, in the Canadian market from, from uh, the, the first days of the Canadian alerting system, which is actually started after IPAWS in the U.S., but we provide French and Spanish, uh, French and English support in Canada. In the Americas, uh, our, our EAS systems support Spanish, Dutch, Creole, and English. 
and something we found out through the, uh, through the auspices of the project. Uh, there are many different flavors of Creole, French Creole, Pigeon Creole. So you know, we sp support all these languages through our EAS capabilities. Uh, in, in Europe, <clears throat> uh, one project that's a little bit near to my heart is in Lithuania, where we're supporting the Lithuanian Fire and Poli Protection Service uh, with a, a nationwide emergency alert system on their version of a public broadcaster. Uh, and again, the language, the, the language is, is Lithuanian. So there is a lot that we've learned on multilingual and have imported it back in some of our approaches in the U.S., merging that with the IPAWS approach for, for, for using the common learning protocol in this country. So let me run through uh, a couple of things real quick. Um, in the public sector space with emergency operations centers, we've provided a, 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 a we've provided a baseline multilingual capability in our USC CAP originator, uh, allowing English and Spanish message entry. Uh, what we'll be initiating within the next, I think, two weeks in our Ford at One software is an upgrade for EOCs that will support EAS and WIA, version 2.0 WIA, with the expanded uh, uh, message text uh, in English and Spanish with, I won't call it auto translation, but automatic message creation in Spanish and English if the emergency operator does not speak Spanish or does not have time to enter in a full WIA message, they can use a standard EAS-like sentence in, in either language and have that sent out into EAS or, or WIA via, via IPAWS. Um, uh, that type of capability is uh, something that John Dooley mentioned in his presentation in the, in the second panel. Uh, the uh, alert creation in English and Spanish, in the case of Minnesota, adding Hmong and Somali support, and I, we didn't think we told him, but he also has French language support on his EAS originator, his CAP originator. Uh, so f in Minnesota, uh, those alert messages can be created in any of those languages in different information blocks that are sent through the IPAWS system. And systems downstream can filter on what message they want, what language they want to use, and display it over their respective technologies. Uh, that's one approach um, uh, that, that we've taken in Minnesota. Uh, Ohio and other state EOCs also have a bilingual support, English and Spanish. So the ability to send out a CAP-based message in multiple languages, uh, CAP is one of two technologies in, in the, in the uh, public warning space in this country. Uh, that, is, that is supported today by, by ourselves and I think numerous other vendors we will be hearing from today. Uh, the, other, uh, um, um, the other approach is EAS. And I guess I'll, I'll go on, on a limb, maybe it's not too far a limb, and say EAS, our conventional EAS system, is a one, best used as a single language system. It's a, a EAS tones followed by an audio payload follow the message, and unless you're going to try to squeeze two, language of, two languages within that two-minute window, your, your most operators are going to rely on an English language message only. So that's a segue to our other area of activity in the broadcast and cable space, and that's EAS encoder decoders. These are really uh, much more than encoder decoder. These emergency information management servers. Uh, what these servers do at a television station or cable plant or, or, or a radio station is uh, filter on an EAS or a CAP message, whichever is received first, and transmit the contents of that out in, at least in CAP, in whatever language the operator has selected. So if it receives a CAP message with English, Spanish, Hmong, Somali, it can play out that message as, as originated by, by the, uh, by the uh, by the Emergency Management Authority. Um, if the Emergency Management Authority has not included its own text, its own, sorry, text to speech or its own voice message, uh, an audio file to play out over these ES technologies, then our products also have the ability to do text to speech in over a dozen languages. So you could spend, send an English or Spanish text message through iPause or local cap system, and uh, our systems will automatically render that, that text into high quality voice. Uh, in a, uh, and up to a dis dozen different languages. Uh, the, uh, the most common ones are English and Spanish. Uh, English and Spanish support is supported uh, uh, natively throughout our systems in, in the U.S. Uh, another, uh, another level of support is auto, I'm going to use this guard term guardedly, auto translation. I don't mean Google-like tra automatic translation of any text that comes by, but again, the creation of a short standard EAS style message uh, if that other language has not been provided. So you may get a very ex extensive evacuation warning in English with no Spanish follow-up or, or French or Somali. Uh, our system will create a standard EAS message after that. And 
it, it fills a gap. It's not perfect. It'd be better if the originator sent the full text of the message, but filling in with a, sp with a Spanish or other language text and, and audio messages, post-audio, uh, does fill in a major gap for, sis for stations that do want to provide some form of bilingual or multilingual support. Um, that's, uh, that's what we're doing right now. Uh, the one thing I'd add to that is trigger cap polling, another system we've developed, another capability we've developed. If we receive an EAS message first, those are those wonderful tones you hear over the air, followed by voice. If a broadcaster cable system uh, using our equipment receives that message first, with trigger cap polling, we'll automatically seek out a cap message. That cap message, which is XML, it's an IP-based message, may well have more text content in English, but also multiple languages. So if we find that cap message that corresponds to the EAS message, we'll use that instead and use it with all the, the handling preferences that, that the broadcaster or the cable operator wants to use. S use Spanish first, then English. English only. Hmong only. Or, or uh, send each language over a different stream as, a, as Twin Cities Public Television was doing. Over the four digital television streams, each, each uh, uh, channel was having a different, uh, different language. So let me, uh, let me wrap off with a thought on the future very quickly. As uh, I so said, we, we tend to be very forward-looking. Uh, we are, we are uh, very supportive of Next Gen TV, which is ATSC 3.0, then the, the next generation digital television standard. We contributed the advanced emergency information, now information, it used to be alerting, the advanced emergency information specification in, in ATSC 3.0. Uh, we were very careful to make sure it had a multilingual support capability within the, within the standard. Uh, we've actually rolled out that technology. Uh, at uh, several beta sites uh, uh, in the U.S., uh, two NAB pilot sites, uh, one in San Bernardino, California, which was tested this week, and Cleveland, Ohio. So ATSC is real. It works. Uh, it works with advanced emergency information and in a multilingual environment. Uh, HD radio, I'll, I'll defer to Ashraf to talk about that. We, we are supportive of, of advanced uh, information, advanced emergency, uh, emergency alerting capabilities over HD radio. And um, um, we're also working on other things. I'll leave that unsaid for the moment, but there's more in the pipeline. Okay. Thanks, Ed. Brian? Thank Good afternoon. Thank you for, very much for the invite today. Um, so in, in, in Everbridge, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're kind of leading the market right now in critical event, critical uh, event management, uh, crisis management solutions. Uh, the goal really to be able to solve the whole problem, um, critical event communications being one part of that. Uh, so we take the multilingual, our multilingual messaging very seriously. We work on how we're going to produce that, how we're going to get out there. Um, we have the integration with iPods. So Right now, we are in the final development stages. We're ready to go live with FEMA when the, the 2.0 comes out um, to be able to support both the English and the Spanish as well as the 360-character uh, count uh, going forward. Uh, but beyond that, we look at more of the whole picture because you know, in, in 2018, the system that we put out there sp uh, sent out over 1.8 billion messages to people across the globe. So you know, those aren't all, fortunately, we have messages uh, otherwise. <laughs> We'd all be hearing everyone shutting that off. Um, so we, we look at all the different modalities from texting to email to cell phone to uh, fax machines even, and even those people who still use pagers today. Um, so our goal is to make sure we get the message out to everybody as best we can uh, based on how they can sign up for messages, how we have messaging or, or modalities for them in the system today. Um, we look at all different languages. So we support well over 20 uh, languages at this time. Uh, through our system and you know people can set up those messages ahead of time they can translate them themselves we can auto translate them for them um, and then they can go out based on how people want to receive their messaging so we don't want to send somebody a message and have it read through four different languages all at the same time we realize you know that's not what the audience is going to want that's not what the public wants that's not what citizens of every community wants they want to receive it in the language that they're comfortable with they're familiar with um, so we strive to make that a reality for them. You know, we want to make sure uh, the messages are crafted correctly, so we have it set up uh, specifically for the ability to, you know, easily create a message for them, easily translate that message, and easily receive that message on their part. Um, going forward in the future, we're always trying to make the system easier to use. Uh, we're making it so it reaches out to modalities much quicker, um, faster, uh, making sure we have the understanding of who's actually receiving it. 
um, you know, we, we get that challenge back to us every day. We work with emergency management folks. We work with the people who use, you know, the WIA technology and the, and, and the IPOS technology. And, you know, we do hear, we don't know who we actually reached. You know, we, we've sent out this message. We're not sure who it went to, how it went out. Um, so the, the big factor for us is knowing who it went to, making sure we can see every person got that message, you know, whether it's uh, through the ability to see that it was received by them, whether it's the ability for them to respond back to us and say they received it, you know, or to answer even a simple question. Um, you know, we want to make sure that the system is used in a way that benefits the emergency community, it benefits the uh, person who's sending out the message to be able to get their job done quicker, uh, understand the challenge that might be going on in their community, and you know, be able to speak the language of the community. Um, I represent several different of our, uh, several of our larger customers. Um, you know, the state of Florida is one of my main customers as well as New York City. Um, I'm sure everybody can understand where you're looking at that. You've got major languages on both. Um, you know, the city of New York sending out in, in 13 different languages on a daily basis. Uh, and then you have, you know, different areas of Florida who, you know, whether it's the Spanish population of the South, whether it's different populations in the North, um, you know, we have to make sure we have a system that's built to respond to those types of communities. Um, so, you know, we have some very great engineering uh, folks. We have some great technical people on our teams that are always looking forward to how do we make this better? You know, how do we support more languages? What languages out there should be supported? Um, you know, as a global company, our concern is outside the U.S. as well as inside the U.S. So we're making sure, you know, internationally we're covering those languages as well. Um, and then we're getting those messages out to the people who need them. Uh, so uh, in general, you know, we are uh, a company that really makes sure for the emergency response community um, that we can take care of their needs. Uh, not only can we take care of them, but we can take care of them quickly uh, and make sure that their messages are heard and delivered to the people they need to get them to. Right, thanks, thank Ryan. You. Brian? <clears throat> Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks, David and Greg. I'd like to, uh, you know, appreciate for being, having the opportunity to be here today to talk uh, a bit more about wireless emergency alerts. Uh, from an AT&T perspective, uh, we've been a participating operator in wireless emergency alerts since its inception. Uh, been transmitting these tens of thousands of alerts that Matt Gerst mentioned earlier uh, since 2012, and uh, uh, definitely have had a lot of successes with it. Um, one of the things that we've been a strong advocate of has been a standards-based solution uh, because we think consistency uh, and interoperability of wireless emergency alerts across operators uh, and uh, our interfaces to FEMA uh, are very important. So uh, we, we started uh, in, in 2008 uh, with the first set of standards for what we're calling WIAD 1.0. Uh, and recently, uh, uh, last year, we completed WIAD 2.0 standards, which included the support of Spanish language. Um, and, and that is, is now part of the WIA 2.0, which is uh, currently waiting for testing with FEMA before uh, we're able to roll that out. But the good news story also is um, if, if you've got an AT&T Android handset, uh, more than likely that currently is, is ready to go with WIA 2.0. Uh, it's, it's ready to support Spanish. Uh, and if you have iOS 12.2, uh, um, that also is ready to go uh, if, you, if you've got that update. So we're prepared. Uh, our network is prepared to support Spanish language. Uh, as I said, the main thing we're doing now is waiting for uh, uh, testing with FEMA and then the rollout, and then we'll be able to uh, receive those alerts from the alert originator in WIA 2.0 format. Um, when you look at Spanish, uh, the, the way this works is there's the primary language, which is English, and the secondary language, which can be turned on by the subscriber, uh, would be Spanish. Uh, the subscriber would receive both languages because English is mandatory to be uh, broadcast and, and displayed on the device. And, uh, uh, the Spanish language then would be displayed as well uh, if that were made available to us from the alert originator. Um, again, the, the, the secondary language does have to come from the alert originator. Uh, we don't do any translations or any creation of messages within our network. Uh, that's all the responsibility of the alert originators. Uh, passes through FEMA iPods and then onto the carrier uh, for delivery out uh, to the mobile devices. Um, 
as far as the future in additional languages, um, certainly uh, that possibility exists. Uh, and, and again, we would look for standards-based solution, uh, a public-private partnership working with the alert originators, uh, the OEMs, uh, device manufacturers, infrastructure vendors, uh, and, and uh, providers in coming up with a standards-based solution. Uh, some of the concerns we have is uh, how many languages? I, I think Francisco mentioned uh, 155 languages in his jurisdiction alone. Well, if I take the 360 characters, that's, that's also part of WIA 2.0, multiply that by 155, that can, becomes a very big number. And the control channels that broadcast these messages can get congested very quickly if we're talking about support for that many alert messages simultaneously going out in, in, a, in a small area, uh, at, such as Harris County. So those are some of the concerns we have to evaluate. Uh, how many languages would we support? What languages are there? Um, currently, uh, we support uh, coding of the alphabet using GSM 7-bit coding. That means 7 bits are used for coding of the alphabet. Um, if we get into some of the other languages, especially Japanese, Korean, and so forth, uh, we have to go to 16-bit. Uh, coding. So that is again going to chew into the payload that we're required to broadcast those alerts. So um, we need to look through that carefully as we add additional languages, what additional languages we add and, and how they're added and, and really think about it closely and come up again with a standards-based solution uh, that would provide consistency and interoperability across devices and networks. Um, the, the other area we talked about was um, translation on the device. Uh, ag again, you know, that's, that's somewhat of a concern. Uh, we are concerned about the accuracy of translations and making sure that the message is p accurately portrayed on the devices. And if the translation is off, then, you know, we could be giving the wrong message to the consumers. Um, our preference would be that the message creation is done by the alert originators, and they are fully responsible for the content of those messages, and that those are delivered to us for broadcast uh, uh, intact uh, without any changing translation or anything on our part. Um, so that, that would be our preference, especially when it comes to you know some languages where words like tornado may not exist. Well, if, if you get tornado in English and have to translate that to a language, what does the device do? So while technology is advancing in that space, um, I think we really need to think carefully uh, to make sure we have consistent messages across devices, uh, same translation software in each device so that the message comes out to be the same in each device and we have a, a, a standardized way of doing things. Um, there was also mention of, uh, you know, other advances in technologies and including FM chipsets were mentioned earlier. Uh, again, we believe that any advances in technology should be driven by, uh, by the market and consumer desires. Um, and, and, you know, we should look at those in the entire ecosystem and, and not just one-off solutions and, and uh, solutions that really adhere to just a specific need rather more general market-driven uh, solutions. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Ezra? Yeah. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to be here this afternoon. Um, it's really exciting to talk about what we're doing in the radio space, and our vision is to upgrade radio systems uh, to better support new technologies and new services. Um, so at Xperia Corporation, we've been working on the HD radio digital broadcasting system. It's actually been uh, in development and deployed for over 20 years. Um, and, and with that service, local AM and FM stations are able to uh, deliver additional content in their broadcasts. So think about additional side carriers on their analog signal that upgrade their services to have multi-channel uh, audio information so they can send up to four audio programs simultaneously. Uh, text information, image information, uh, and anything that is digitized in, in any way. So as we've been rolling out that service, we've been looking at how to, um, to better enable their emergency notification capability. And one of the key things with radio broadcasting is during a time of emergency, people tune to the radio. They also tune to TV and, and through their phone, but um, we've typically seen uh, as systems um, are not reliable, radio tends to be one of the more reliable approaches for uh, getting information. So 
our approach was to look at how can we utilize our services, our digital pipe to uh, enhance the emergency notification systems. Uh, we've been partnering with a lot of the uh, um, uh, equipment manufacturers, uh, two of them represented up here today, um, and worked through interfaces that allow us to take the, uh, the originated uh, CAP messaging and extract the relevant portions of that, whether it's the, uh, the um, message type, the priority, the text notification for that, and push that through the digital broadcast. Our goal is not to um, manipulate that message in any way. We don't originate any content. We're really pushing it through from the um, uh, alert manager uh, equipment into the radio broadcasting. Um, and with that, uh, we do support the, the CAP uh, message structure uh, through IPAWS. Um, currently, our system provides uh, support for up to 26 languages. And, uh, and with that, that's uh, really the, the text notification uh, coming through, which would pop up on a radio device, whether it's in the car, the home, or on your uh, mobile handset. Um, that service supports up to 380 characters, so we, uh, we are able to, uh, to support quite a bit of text notification with that. Um, on the receiver side, the consumer has the option of selecting uh, in their device what language priority they want. Um, so the radios that are uh, capable of HD emergency alerting uh, would have a menu option. You can select primary language Spanish, um, Portuguese, English, and set the priority for that. So that gives them a way as, as a consumer to determine how they want to receive the messaging. Um, as we're looking forward to where we're going with this, uh, we're looking at how to now take the multiple audio feeds that we can uh, transmit and working with the NAB and with uh, Digital Alert Systems and SAGE, how to extract maybe a, a multi-language audio message and allow the broadcaster to distribute that um, audio programming across three or four different audio channels on their digital broadcast. So now the, the broadcaster can select, in my community I know I need uh, English, Spanish, and maybe Korean and how do I get those messages uh, out in an audio format, uh, they can use their HD2 channel, their HD3 channel, uh, to send that audio notification. And, you know, this was kind of interesting as we were talking to some tribal groups, uh, and, and they were feeling uh, underrepresented in terms of um, radio broadcasting and emergency notification via radio. Uh, and we're very intrigued at how we could do that and maybe uh, aid them in reaching their, uh, their groups more uh, regularly. Um, and in addition to just over-the-air broadcast, we're exploring concepts within what's called hybrid radio. So how can we bridge the gap between uh, wireless technology and radio technology and, and offer additional content, uh, maybe not only to HD radio receivers, but also through analog receivers. Uh, and that hybrid radio system would allow um, additional links to be pushed through uh, a, a 5G, 4G service uh, into the radio device uh, that would then give the, the user or the listener capability to link to a, a map or uh, other uh, notification information uh, that, that's richer and deeper. Um, so I think, you know, we, we've got some interesting uh, approaches for uh, upgrading radio broadcasting today, uh, and we're also looking at how to expand that in the future. Great. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, Pat? <clears throat> All right, thank you. So again, uh, I'm Pat Feldhausen, an offering manager with The Weather Company, and I'm very excited to be here with you guys today to discuss kind of what we do uh, today with regards to some of our emergency alerting and uh, also take a look at what we're planning to do in the future. Um, so currently, we have a, a solution for broadcast television stations to uh, monitor the NOAA weather wire kind of in real time and then dynamically create graphics um, that get put on the air with a uh, crawl message a, uh, a map with, you know, animating radar, uh, you know, showing where the, uh, you know, county fills, where the warnings are, et cetera. And we can provide that in English and or Spanish. It's up to the user to, uh, to decide. 
And we also provide the text-to-speech audio for the crawl message in English or Spanish. Um, so that's, that's primarily what we focus on today. It's, it's strictly weather. A um, couple things where the current technology and the current way that warnings are originated um, kind of hold us back. One is, you know, I, I say that we can support Spanish, um, but the message we're able to provide in English is much better uh, because we can include the text from the National Weather Service bulletin, um, which will give you very important details, for example, during a tornado warning. You know, tornado warning, tornadoes on the ground near this such and such location, you know, take shelter immediately. Um, we can't auto translate that message into Spanish, and it's not made available to us on the weather wire feed in Spanish. So um, the Spanish crawl would just be, you know, a more generic. There's a tornado warning in effect until such and such a time where the uh, English version can be much more robust. The other, the other limitation we have today is the way that television stations broadcast their alerts. Um, you know, for, for television users is they have a viewing area and everybody in the viewing area gets the same alert. Um, so what that causes is you know, some over alerting. So for example, you've got some severe weather starting to initiate in the northeast portion of your viewing area. And uh, you know, for the last two hours, there's alerts on the screen and nobody in the southwest part of it cares. A um, Couple of hours later, now, now it starts initiating in the southwest. We have tornadoes, and everybody's tuned out because they've been getting these alerts all day. And oh, it's not for us. It's in the northeast part of the part of the viewing area. Um, so, looking forward, um, as uh, as has been mentioned here, the ATSC 3.0 standard is going to allow us to solve some of these issues. Um, so, the weather company, along with uh, a few other companies, uh, Mr. Zarnecki's uh, company included, is a member of a industry consortium called AWARN, which is the Advance Warning and the Response Network. And what we're doing as, as, a, as a group is trying to define a framework for how we can take, a, take advantage of this new technology. And I know we've, we've kind of mentioned 3.0 a little bit. I want to just talk a little bit about what some of the advantages are that it's going to allow us uh, to do in the future. Um, one of them is geotargeting. So just Going back to my last point about over-alerting, uh, with 3.0 transmissions, uh, we'll be able to geo-target uh, television sets. So, um, for example, if there's a severe thunderstorm warning in the northeast part of the county, we can just send it to those viewers and everybody else won't get it. So um, it, it will help solve the over-alerting issue. Um, another benefit is additional multimedia. So you're, you know, you're basically taking your television set or your handheld device and making it into an internet browser. So we can send additional assets with the warning, um, you know, radar maps that are centered on the viewer's uh, location. Um, instead, of, instead of just being the entire DMA view, we can give them exactly where the threat is. Um, it doesn't have to be weather, it could be any other type of emergency information. Um, but the, you know, the important thing is that A, the, the alert has uh, geo-targeted geo information, geofencing. And, um, and then that we have access to the additional assets or, you know, we do a really good job ourselves <laughs> of um, generating digital media assets for display on other devices. Uh, another, another big benefit of 3.0 is going to be resiliency. Uh, so we mentioned earlier the, uh, the wireless emergency alerts, uh, which are great. Um, however, uh, as was mentioned, you know, when the hurricane came through and it wiped out the cell network, um, a lot of the uh, broadcast stations are kind of hardened facilities and will be able to stay in the air um, after after the, the disaster of the hurricane. Um, so in that case, you know, looking a few years down the line, if users have, you know, mobile devices um, that have 3.0 receive technology, which we should really push for those mobile devices to have that, um, then they will be able to, you know, when the cell network is down, they can still receive the ATSC 3.0 transmission on their mobile device. Um, and those are you know, battery operated devices. So even if the power grid's down, as long as they have a charged device, they'll be able to uh, get that information. And then lastly, and, and obviously um, is multilingual support. Um, so you know, the vision is that uh, these user received devices can set a native language. And when we send out the message, uh, we'll send it out you know, with, uh, send the message including 
multiple languages, and the device will decide which language to display. So um, those are kind of some of the things that we're excited about as far as the future of alerting and, and how it can uh, help us with uh, some of the limitations we have today. Okay, thanks, Pat. Thank yep. Harold? Hi, I'm Harold Price from uh, President of the Stage Alerting Systems. I've been working on uh, EAS since the field trials in 1994, and Christmas Day 1994 started working on our first project, the, the Sage Index. So been at this for a while. I want to thank Dave and uh, Greg for hosting this and, and point out that Greg worked a long time in EAS, and now he's working in the interagency sort of things, talking to people, among other things, talking to people about how they can better use EAS, and that's a, and that's a good thing. Uh, so just wanted to point that out. You've got a bunch of technologists here for a large part, certainly technology companies up at the table, and people like to talk about what they're working on now, and what they're working on now is two to five years off in, into the future. Uh, the same is true at Sage. However, what I want to talk about today is the importance of realizing that the installed base has capability now for multilingual. It can be used to do things today. Uh, it's a chicken and an egg thing, and unless you're actually using it, you can't use it. Unless you are originating messages in multiple language, the system can send multiple uh, multiple languages. The system has the capability to do it, has been tested. Uh, FEMA has uh, made a point of sending the National Periodic Test, which uh, has been sent, I think, uh, three times via CAP. They've sent it with both English and, and Spanish, proving that that can be done, reminding people that it can be done. There are people who do it. Uh, uh, day to day in the field, not a lot of people do it. It can be done right now. Will it be done better five years from now? Yes. When I was a young lad, I was a guest on a talk show and someone called in and said, this uh, new uh, IBM uh, the AP, is it better than the XT and should I wait a year to buy it? And my answer then is that it is now. No, if, what, if what's available now does what you need and you need it now, buy it now. Don't wait till <laughs> next year. Next year, you'll be waiting until next year again. If we wait for things, technologies that are out two to five years before we get systems in place to originate alerts in multiple languages, five years from now I have the same problems. Nobody is originating them. So let's not lose, uh, lose sight of that. Someone else said on one of the earlier panels as well that we're going to look back at this and say this wasn't hard. And individually, the individual pieces that the various companies here do were all at different points in the, in the infrastructure. Uh, individually, those pieces aren't hard just taken by themselves. The hard part is hooking it all together, is taking someone to originate that alert and have it end up on the device of the user's choice in a way that the originator intended. And it has been pointed out here several times as well. Nobody's really happy with automatic translation because you lose control. The originator said this, what came out was that, whose fault was it that the user was misinformed? Those kind of questions come up, not to assign blame, but to say, well, who's going to fix it? Who's going to make it better the next time? Automatic translation really takes out of the hands of the originator what gets delivered. The same thing for text-to-speech, which is a translation thing as well. You've got to craft a message carefully to make text-to-speech work. It needs punctuation. That's how text-to-speech knows to drop at the end of a sentence rather than the end of a sentence. It's a different, totally different thing. If you don't have punctuation, it's not going to work well. If you say, Sally Jones, DOB 6873 is in car LIC colon, you know, my wheels, that's hard to get text-to-speech to do as well. Fairly easy to do it right at the origination point, much harder to fix by the time it gets to the end user. So that's what I mean by end-to-end -end is hard. Not impossible, not very hard, but it's not trivial. And we all need to work together to make that easier and easier. And we can do that using technology today rather than waiting for technology tomorrow. Uh, the Sage, we focus primarily on radio stations. Majority of the radio stations in the US and Canada have, uh, have Sage equipment. We go towards making it as easy as possible for radio. Now, radio is a lot easier to do than cable. Uh, cable has. Sometimes they say 14 different generations of set-top boxes they have to deal with. Uh, radios, you take an AM radio with uh, cat's whiskers and it, it still works, for today anyway. Uh, so that's our main customer base. We try and make things as simple for 
those folks to use as possible. It's been fairly successful, and it's fairly simple to get messages out on radio and TV as well. Uh, cable has some additional issues, but at the end of the day, it's also possible to get uh, multilingual messages out on cable. Al Kenyon had an example of something he saw just the other day where it all worked fine. English and Spanish on a crawl on top of the screen overlaying other information that was appearing on the screen. So it works. It works today. Um, something else not to lose sight of, HD radio. There's new things coming in the future. HD radio today, Sage has several hundred customers in the field today using HD radio where we send the text message to the HD equipment and it's able to send it out to radios, compatible radios are able to display the, the text information. More stuff like that is coming in the future. Again, uh, multilingual capabilities. Uh, our next release will support some additional multilingual capabilities that are already existent in the HD radio specs. Uh, we've been partnering with Xperia since we're trying to remember here 2010 probably uh, to do these things. And sadly, that's almost 10 years ago. Uh, and even though I'm only 30, it's hard to imagine. Um, so those are, again, things that are doing today. Of course, we're involved in the future as well, but let's keep our eye on the current ball, which is our existing problems, existing alerts happening every day. Let's not wait to fix them. Okay. Thanks, okay. Harold. Uh, and I'd like to uh, ask you and, and Ed to uh, a, a follow-up question on that. Um, today, the, the cap rules, the FCC cap rules, mm -hmm. and the eSig guide, which sets forth the procedures for um, translating cap alerts into the legacy EAS that everybody is familiar with that you hear over, over the air, uh, has provisions for, um, for, for alert originators to uh, affect multilingual alerts. And the way they do that is, as, uh, as I think I'll mention early on, is they can you know, set certain uh, settings in the, in the cap uh, alert to look at this language, that language. And, and when that cap alert arrives at the EAS participant at the radio station, TV station, or, or cable head end or what have you, if that um, entity uh, EAS device has the uh, TTS, the text to speech that you talked about, um, enabled in it, um, and and that 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 entity has elected to to air that alert, then then it'll go out in that language. And theoretically, there's a lot of languages you could use, whatever is available in the market and works. And that's the part I want to talk about a little bit here. What has been your collective experience uh, with TTS? Where do you think that? Um, that uh, 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 technology is in terms of reliability and, and usability. And then there's also the practical issue of, uh, of, of working with the same language in different areas. So just because some, one area of, of, of the country might, might pronounce um, uh, uh, an air of Spanish one way, if you go to another area, maybe there's, uh, it pronounces it a little different. There's a lot of nuances in language, of course. So um, Ed can, can, can speak to that. Uh, I guess let me tackle that question by looking at the, the whole data flow, the workflow. And this could be Everbridge or the DAS EOC or other products. An emergency manager has an option to compose a message in a number of, message, in a number of languages. Uh, they could choose to append, upload, link a file resource. So record the audio or do text to speech at the front of the system that the Sage or the DAS deck or the Trilithic unit could pull back and grab that audio. So you don't need text-to-speech in that type of scenario. Of course, I'm always nervous about putting more and more stuff on the cloud, you're reaching around, but that's one approach. If an emergency manager does not compose an audio source, an audio resource, then you, f you can fall back to text-to-speech. Uh, text-to-speech engines have matured quite a bit over the last few years. Uh, we offer a variety of, of voices, not just languages, but voices. We've got William, which uh, has almost a Canadian pronunciation. You'll see that in Canada. We've got David, which is kind of Midwestern U.S. There's Dallas, which is uh, self-explanatory. We don't really use that too much. Um, there was a New York one. I like that one. Nobody else does. Anyway, most people in the U.S. use David. Um, I think Harold may agree with me. The end result of text-to-speech is only as good as the input. If you're lacking punctuation, if you're using, if you make it look like a teletype announcement rather than a, a text message, uh, garbage in, garbage out as all computer world goes. So um, the text-to-speech technology itself is pretty mature. 
uh, the usage of the system is, is where attention, additional attention needs to be focused. Uh, I'm on the Common Look and Feel Committee in, in Canada. And in Canada, uh, they put their system on the air after the U.S., but their system is cap only. They don't have the legacy aspects of it. So some of the problems are simpler to see. Uh, they originally rolled out the system using what I would call endpoint text-to-speech. The actual cap box at each station would do the text-to-speech conversion. The problem is with text-to-speech, especially for weather alerts, which they are using in, in Canada, sending direct to their, to their radio stations, is the pronunciation of place names, among many other problems. And Environment Canada had, I think the number was 400,000 different place names that, that they, could, uh, they could send. To have each individual end user station or each individual area to pick both what voice they want to use but also what the pronunciation of these things is, it's one more thing to have the radio or, or TV station have to worry about or somebody has to worry about it. Somebody has to know how to pronounce those names. Uh, what Environment Canada did and Pelmerex, which is the aggregator, kind of the role that, uh, that FEMA has at least as far as collating the messages and sending them out is concerned. Uh, they moved away from using endpoint boxes to do it, and they have centralized text-to-speech. That gets the control closer to the originator. There are a small number of originators and then just one aggregator. They can tune the box to how they want it to say. Is it kilometer, kilometer, kilometer? How do you want to do it in that area? How do you pronounce the Pol Boulevard versus Sepulveda Boulevard? Who knows that? Certainly the device manufacturers can't track down 40,000. I said to them, well, we'll give it a shot. Where's your pronunciation dictionary? Well, we don't have one. I said, well, I can start in Vancouver and work my way east, go house to house, and ask how to pronounce their local town name, but it doesn't seem very effective. So they did two things. One is they took over control of how to pronounce them. The second one is they reduced the number of town names. They came up with a much smaller set. It's either 3,000 or 30,000, I forget which, but a, order, a couple of order of magnitude less than what they started with. And they agreed to, when they send out alerts, to use that subset of names. They were using you know, big names rather than individual town names. And that has somewhat mitigated the problem. The problem they had was what came out the end of the box wasn't quite as good as what it would have been if somebody was reading it. And there was a lot of pushback from the user community, from the, the listeners, as to how, how this is. If you listen to text-to-speech all the time, it sounds better and better. And the best way to demo text-to-speech is to hand someone the text it's going to say and then say, well, listen to how good this is. Well, if you've already read it, then text-to-speech will be pretty bad and it still sounds pretty good. But to just take a, a consumer, set them down and say, what did this say? Here's a burst of 30 seconds. It is actually very difficult to understand what's being said. Albeit, as Ed says, text-to-speech is getting better and better. Is it good enough to carry emergency information that you're not used to listening to in a time of high stress with mispronunciation, misintonation, and all the rest of it? Human voice doing it, always better. A tuned voice doing it from a central location, second best. End users doing it individually on a case-by-case -case basis, not quite so good. Okay. But it is still an effective tool in the box and is better than nothing. Okay. Th thanks, Harold. Uh, this question, oh, sorry, go ahead. And, and just one point of clar clarification. Uh, I tend to agree with that, with, with the exception that when you're getting into a true multilingual environment, Minnesota again, uh, where we have devices across the state translating in English, Spanish, Hmong, and Somali, the emergency management operator is not going to have somebody on staff 24-7, 365 doing Hmong and Somali. That was a big challenge we ran into at the beginning of the project. That's why we moved toward uh, text-to-speech and some auto-translation at the edge, especially when you're getting into exotic languages. That takes the burden, an unrealistic burden, off of the emergency manager and, and allows the handling of boutique or niche languages or exotic languages at the edge of the system, like Hmong and Somali. And that's not tomorrow. That's, that's, we've been doing that for four years now in Minnesota, so that's, that's a real world today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so for uh, our standards guys, uh, uh, Brian, uh, Ashraf, and Pat, um, I'd, I'd like to ask you, because uh, we really haven't, uh, we haven't spoken a whole lot about this, but f uh, with respect to ASL, um, what, what kind of capabilities for uh, transmitting ASL um, versions of alert content and just emergency information generally do you see uh, your 
uh, respective technologies. Uh, how, how do you see that playing out moving forward? Yeah, I'll go ahead and start. Sure. Um, start. Uh, you, yeah, from, from wireless emergency alert perspective, uh, I think Matt mentioned this earlier in his presentation that we have the capability for, for transmitting URLs uh, within the alert. And uh, fr from our perspective, that's the best way to provide that multimedia content uh, or ASL content uh, would be to provide those links in the message. Uh, and then the users that need to go off and get that information uh, can select that link and, and that information would be present to them. I uh, also wanted to just touch on the resiliency of, of the, the networks. I, I mean, cellular networks are extremely resilient. Um, and not only do we carry, you know, wireless emergency alerts, but there's a lot of other public safety information that's carried across our networks, whether it be healthcare, uh, law enforcement, what have you. Um, so our networks are, are built to be resilient. Uh, and even if, um, you know, there's, there's uh, an event such as a hurricane, uh, we're prepared for that. We pre-stage uh, people and assets uh, in, in those events. Uh, it's not something like it's going to happen overnight. We have, usually have a few days' notice. So we're ready for those, and, and we go in and restore those networks to any damage that's done as a result of those events very quickly uh, because there's a lot of uh, need for our networks for communication, whether it be for public safety or, or just individuals wanting to call their loved ones and see, see if they're okay. So. I, I wouldn't use resiliency as, as a reason to push any specific technology into handsets. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, with regard to additional content, uh, we're, we're currently working on what we call our phase two emergency alerting system. And that's going to allow the, the radio station to extract uh, URL images, audio files, uh, and, and push them out uh, over the air into the radio device. Um, so really what we're seeing is, is some additional content being pushed and then links to additional content as well, either through a hybrid radio service or directly over the air. Thank you. Pat? Yeah, so um, as far as additional content, uh, uh, one of our solutions um, is kind of a, what we call an event, detect event detection, detection engine, if I can say it. Event detection engine. And what that does is, we, you know, we give that you know, any, any sort of uh, input to look out for, and we're sending out geo-targeted alerts today, um, not over broadcast, but on other platforms, um, including multimedia assets uh, that we dynamically create um, on the systems at the television station. So um, we're certainly uh, familiar with uh, operating that type of environment um, and, you know, putting in additional links and, and things of that nature uh, with that content is certainly uh, something we're able to do. Okay, thank you. Nice yeah, I just look, one little follow-up on this issue, and then I have a separate question. As I recall, uh, uh, Brian, way back when we were working in the advisory committee, we had a really good presentation by a, uh, an organization called DefLink, mm -hmm. and whom I believe were mentioned by one of the participants in, in, in one of the earlier uh, 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 panels. And what they do is they do a little ASL box that, that they will do almost simultaneously ASL translation. You said, well, that didn't fit into the architecture that was being recommended for, for WIA. It could be installed as an app, and it could, there are a number of ways that you could take advantage of that. And I think at least one of the um, uh, earlier presentations, and I, for the life of me, don't remember who, uh, uh, is already working with them now. So, I mean, there are, there, there are ways of getting ASL, which is essentially a visual medium into other things. But I have a question for, I guess it's really for the panel, but I'll start with, 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 with Ed and Brian. Let's say I'm the, I'm the local government guy, and I want to begin to initiate more sophisticated alerts, including cap-based and having uh, 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 multiple languages in there, the first guy I'm going to be talking to, Brian, is you, because I'm going to be using your system to input my data as it goes to iPaws. And it's going to go through iPaws, it's going to come out the other end, and it's going to go to Ed, or it's going to go to Harold, to ben, then be delivered over the broadcast, and it would certainly then also go through iPaws for the wireless. But if we're doing this super multilingual, we're still at this point talking about EAS. Um, what do you need to do to help me know what to do? I guess is really what I'm saying. How do, how do you then work with that local government to make sure that they're not only doing IPAWS to get EAS and WIA, but they're also doing whatever, all the other offerings that Everbridge, for example, might have? 
and then at the end, at the other end, Ed and, 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 and Harold, how do you make sure that the broadcasters are in line to be able to deliver this thing that under the rules they're supposed to have, and they're pretty good about it, but they need a little bit of help to make sure that this comes out the way it goes in. Anyhow, so Brian. No, great. Um, so what we look at with them is we built the system so that they can do multifunctional messaging. So there's you know the ability to broadcast out to iPods via EAS, um, separate them out. So as of, as it stands now, you know we as a 90 character count. EAS has obviously a greater uh, character count available to it. So we don't want to tie their hands and say everything has to go out the same way. Um, and then when they're looking at their community and they're sending out their general messages and their emergency messaging, give them yet that other option. So at the end of the day, you have to make that as easy as possible. You know, so a standard workflow to keep their, their messaging out to a cell phone or a home phone or a fax machine or, or whatever modality they choose to, to target or all of those at the same time. You know, and then giving them within that same workflow the ability to go easy into the EAS, the WIA technology. Um, so through that, we do it with many different ways. We can build a template so that they have these things at the disposal ahead of time. Um, stressful environment. Uh, I worked in emergency services for you know close to 25 years. I've been through many different disasters. You know, you start to lose track of you know what you have to say when it has to go out because you're managing a, a multi-complex environment. Um, so the more you can do of that during a blue sky event and get those messaging cadences down, getting your your templates down, getting your general uh, even translated messages down, so you're not having to rely on auto translation. You're not having to rely on the different sources to do that. Um, when you can do that ahead of time, you know, and then just be able to tweak that a tiny bit for the actual uh, event, you know, you're much further along in the game than the person who has to sit there at the time and you know try to really get that composed during the disaster. Let me just follow up on that a little bit. So that you have the capability, for example, and I think it was uh, Jesus in one of the earlier panels, talked about create, you know, you know the things that are coming your way. You, right. you might be in a place that gets tornadoes, you're in a place that gets floods. So you set up templates mm -hmm. that just need a couple of fill in the blanks, if at all, but, you're, but you have the capability of doing that in multiple languages. Correct. Right now we okay. have the, the current capability. You know, if you've got the language that you want to send it out to, you can build that template ahead of time pop in that language translation for it ahead of time. Um, you know, some of our customers, they, they have people that they pay to do that for them. You know, on, on any given type of notification, they have, you know, hundreds if not thousands of different templates, you know, already translated into the different languages they need to send out to, um, so that when that time comes, they're pulling that template, sending it out, you know, and getting that out there quickly so that it's more effective to the community. Okay. We, can, we operate on both ends of the spectrum, or both sides of the Oreo cookie, as it were. We, we also provide uh, alert origination systems for for, uh, for state and county users. Um, I, and I guess all I can say is ditto or <laughs> what he said. Uh, but you take an example like Everbridge, which has hundred, uh, thousands of users uh, at, the, at the municipal, county, and state level. Uh, our systems, which have well, hundreds of users, uh, county, state users, uh, territory users, um, the bottom line is that the multilingual origination capability is there in different, slightly different ways, but the multilingual origination capability is there, whether that's through creating templates and storing them in advance or some on-the-fly auto-translation of short EAS messages they can send out. That capability is there. Um, how do we reach out to emergency managers and encourage them to use this technology? Quite honestly, that's that's a discussion we're having in real time, at least within our organization. How do we, how do we bring more emergency managers to the table in terms of using multilingual for the community? Uh, I know you're looking for an answer to the question. We're posing the same question. How do we get them to take avail, take them? Uh, how do we get emergency managers to avail themselves of the tools we've already built? I think I saw a note from iPaws in, in a recent article. Their, their question is, how do we get emergency managers to use iPaws? Period. Hundreds of jurisdictions, thousands of jurisdictions have the iPaws tool set, but they rarely use it. Why is that? I don't think any of us in the room have that answer yet. Go to the other side of the equation. Working with broadcasters uh, and cable operators, um, we're market driven. If a broadcaster wants to use multilingual, if they want to use primarily Spanish, to be honest, uh, we will support them. We have the ability to. Uh, to, to walk them through how to configure their systems to do Spanish, French, uh, Spanish or English, 
or one of those as a primary language followed by a second language as post audio. We support all that. We'll work with the customer uh, and, 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 and work through their particular technical challenges. Um, but again, we're market driven. We're not evangelizing the usage. We're listening to how they want to use it. Uh, cable is particularly complex. Hundreds of channels. Um, and how they use multilingual is, is still to be determined, if they do at all. Their primary language of operation is English, quite honestly. And you, it's not easy, would not be easy, in fact, would be, frankly, nightmarish to engineer a solution to put in individual languages over individual channels. That's, that would be an extraordinarily expensive and complex under, undertaking of a complete redesign of the cable, of the cable system. So um, there are challenges there. Um, broadcasting, radio and cable may be the easiest to get it into a multilingual, multilingual alerting environment. Okay, just one little tiny follow-up and then we can move on. Can you talk a little bit about what New York is doing? We just were reading about that and Ben Krakauer and I exchanged yeah. a couple of emails, but we didn't, weren't able to get anything, but hear from him on that. But if you can talk a little bit about it, it I think it's really fascinating. Sure. So New York City, um, obviously very large population, uh, a lot of people coming in and out on a daily basis. Um, their requirement, uh, effective Monday, July 1st, is uh, every public message must be sent out in multilingual format. So currently they're doing 13 languages. Um, they're all processed through our system, through the templates I was talking about. So they're pre-scripted, they're ready to go. Um, you know, we can process those out in one stroke, you know, so one keystroke and send out all 13 templates at the same time. Uh, from there it goes through the through our system and processes it out to the people who need to get it in the, in the specified language that they requested it in. Um, it's a it's been a long process. I mean, we've been working on this. They, they're dedicated to this. They've been working on this for well over a year now um, to get this to go out. Uh, it looks like it's it's ready to go. It's it's working very well. Um, we expect to see some really great messaging going out. So how do, I mean is it is it is it an opt-in text message? Is it something that goes yeah, through so iPause? The, the how, notify how NYC the is notify NYC is their uh, you know origination. That's where people sign up to receive messages through their system. Um, so it is an opt-in type basis. Uh, they do use iPods. Again, it's probably more for the real severe notifications. I think that's across the board for emergency services. You know, when, when an emergency manager thinks of iPods, they're, they're really focusing on this is a real life safety issue. This is, this is the most extreme incident we're going to see. Uh, and then they pull the trigger for that. Uh, you know, some challenges come with that. There's a lot of reasons behind, you know, why waiting so long and, and things of that nature. But at the end of the day, um, you know, they use all the tools they have at their disposal. So whether that's people who prefer a simple text message or a phone call, um, and you have to, you know, look at your entire demographic. You have, you know, from young folks who can get it, prefer text message, prefer an email, something like that, to the older generations who may only have a landline right now. You know, they don't. They're not sophisticated with the smartphones or they have the older flip phones that aren't going to deliver as well as maybe a new smartphone may. Um, so you have to look at the total population when you're sending out your messaging you know, and not focus on what might be the newest adventure out there, the new iPhone or the new you know, smartphone that might, out, might be out there. You have to more look at the user who's ex you're going to receive that message. Um, and that's what New York City's done. They, they looked at everybody who's possibly going to get a message and they work to make sure that everybody will get a message. But nonetheless, that could, if it were being combined with, with a WIA, take advantage of the, of, of the hyperlink, of, of, of the URL capability. Absolutely. To take somebody with an English or a Spanish message and take them to something there may be more content. Correct. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, I have Thanks. a question. I have a question for, uh, I guess, for everybody, and that is um, what advice would you give to state and local emergency management authorities that are um, would like to do more uh, for, for multilingual learning and, and are just kind of in the beginning stages and are want to want to you know put put in something that's effective. What, what kind of um, based on your experiences, what advice would you give them other than buy our products? <laughs> <laughs> So I, I could start with this. I mean, I, I do this on a daily basis now, and it's really, you know, understanding your population and what your population's ex expectations are coming back from you. Um, you know, we're on a day where it's not acceptable not to be able to reach out to every language that's, that's within your jurisdiction um, to some extent, you know. So to be able to understand what you have at your disposal now, understand the capabilities it has for you, 
um, and then be able to uh, determine how effectively you can use that on a day-to-day -day basis. So it, it's truly understanding the technology that exists and what technology you have to make that work. Um, you know, together with knowing your population, you know, there's really no excuse to not be able to send out a multilingual message or understand how to get that done today. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that in, in terms of understanding what technologies your local broadcasters have uh, and really engaging with them on a regular basis in terms of how they uh, are able to reach the different demographics uh, is, is pretty critical. Um, and, and just getting back maybe to Greg's point on what is it that you would need from us uh, to, to maybe improve some things, you know, one of the interpretations of the current regulations is that an alert that goes out needs to be broadcast on all channels. So the interpretation is for HD radio or digital radio broadcasting. If you have four audio channels, the same alert has to go out on each of those. It doesn't necessarily lend itself to how do you handle the multilingual alert, even though it's the same um, alert notification, it's in different languages. And so the interpretation is not quite clear uh, on where that should go or how to manage that. And so I think if we reconcile that and then start engaging with the uh, state emergency managers on that capability available on their local stations, then they can uh, engage better uh, with the community on multilingual. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Um, you, you, one thing I've always heard is that emergencies are local. So going back to understanding uh, you know, your, your own uh, area, your own population, uh, and what needs to be done is very important. Um, as you know, we, we mentioned here, I think Ed mentioned earlier that there's a lot of jurisdictions that have the capability to initiate alerts, whether it be through WIA, uh, through IPAWS to WIA or EAS or otherwise, uh, but may not be taking full advantage of it. I, I think that needs to be overcome uh, before we understand how we add multiple languages in, in, into that as well. Um, we need to continue with the public-private partnership in the, in the enhancements to WIA uh, and, and find out exactly what's needed and, and how best to address those, uh, whether it be using uh, multiple capabilities through URLs and, and other systems uh, or embedding it within enhancements to WIA itself. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, continuing with, with the direction that we've gone uh, in the past for these enhancements by pulling together the key stakeholders and, and addressing the needs and then looking at what technology solutions are available. I, I think that's important. Thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about, about, about training. I think one of the, the themes that we're seeing here uh, among a number of panels is that the capabilities are there. There's a lot you can do today, whether it's a technical solution or whether it's a, a sort of a collegial solution among broadcasters. There's a lot of ways to solve this problem. The, the issue is how do you get the alert initiators, usually government entities, um, to, to realize what these resources are and take advantage of them. And, and so for folks who've had experience with, with, with governments, what, what have you seen as success stories? What are the ones, the ways to get them engaged and, 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 and the methods by which, you know, you can really get a successful outcome? And I'll leave that open to the floor. Okay. Can I tell uh, So sure. let's, let's look at Minnesota again. Uh, that was a bottom-up project, ground up. Uh, the local public broadcaster, uh, mentioned Don Happelman, who's a great guy, uh, he said, the capability is there with CAP, why aren't we doing multiple languages? And that simple question to John Dooley grew into a major project. Um, the emergency manager saw the value of it and immediately, had, immediately bought into it, especially when they understood the technologies were there. Uh, a, little, a couple of things needed to be added, and I, I should give a, a large shout out for, to Lily McDonald and, and the, the ECHO, group, um, which is affiliated with Twin Cities Public Broadcasting. Um, training or orientation of the emergency manager yeah. was one thing. Okay, yeah. so the community got it in Minnesota really quickly. The broadcasters jumped on board willingly and, and contributed their time, their resources, modified technologies, and it actually wasn't, the training wasn't a whole lot of work. The technologies were actually very easy because they existed already. The big part, and this is where I'm giving Lillian the shout out, was the language, the lexicon. In Hmong and Somali, for example, there, there's not a word for, for tornado. You mentioned that example. <laughs> Lillian worked with the community to get agreement within the community with the state, among speakers, among, the Smaller speakers, how, what word are they gonna use for, for, for tornado? 
for, for other natural disaster events where there's no corresponding uh, word in the language. So now we've got this, uh, the, this, uh, another question, training of uh, limited English proficiency communities orientation of those communities yeah. to use these new uh, emergency tools where they really haven't been integrated into the, oh, the PSAs. The PSAs. And it goes, it goes further than that as well. The, the PSAs were, were, were amazing. So, um, Just to let folks know what we're talking about, we, the uh, Project ECHO uh, 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 and, and the state of Minnesota filed for waivers uh, to the Public Safety Bureau to allow them to do PSAs that would actually use that eh, 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 Tone, and it's a big rule against that. There's a big rule against it for a good reason, because it usually contains a lot of data, and you don't want to trip off false alerts and equipment. So we were able to come up with simulations of that, and then allowed uh, 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 Minnesota to use PSAs that had a simulation of the tone. Because just as these folks don't know have a word for a tornado, they had no idea what the EAS tones signified, where all the rest of us just assume it. So, so it was a big part of the outreach. Big outreach. And so, I mean, I kind of maybe duck your question a little bit, but um, uh, in terms of the, uh, what can be done to train the emergency managers to orient them, uh, really, as has been said multiple times, if they understand their local communities, they're going to understand where there is a need for, for filling the gap on communications in different languages. And that need is going to differ from county to county, even municipality to municipality. But the commonality is that you have to go out and go talk to those people. Go talk you got, to your, you you to talk to to your people. constituents. You got to talk to your people. Okay. No, you, I mean, you have to take every advantage to, you know, do your outreach. Your public outreach is important. Um, you know, during hurricane season, I see it as a resident of Florida now. Um, you know, there's a tremendous outreach in the April, May time frame as we start heading toward the June uh, start of hurricane season. You know, and it, it's all about the education of it. It's, it's making sure people understand uh, what their notification system does, how, it, how to sign up for it, how they're going to get messages on it. You know, and I'm already starting to talk to, you know, a lot of our customers about you know, the, the test coming up in August for um, EAS, you know, and, and making sure that, you know, when we, when the presidential alert came out, it was all about, you know, pushing out the message, letting people know that this message was coming out. Um, perhaps using something other than the word presidential alert may have made it a little more comfortable for people, but at the end of the day, it was really making sure people understand what that message means, how it's going to come out, you know, and how you're going to receive those. And it's educating the emergency manager as well to understand how to educate the public. You know, and we do that very well by providing uh, information, public information for them to send out. Uh, we have pre-scripted messages that we can give them to educate the communities and let them understand how you know, messages are, are, are sent out and why they're important to receive them. Um, you know, it's been mentioned about earlier about over notification. That's always the crux to messaging. When you start doing over notification, you tune people out. People start dropping your services. People start, you know, turning it off on their phones and those things. So uh, it's really a, a fine tune training aspect, but um, done well, and I've seen it done very well in, in certain communities, uh, it's also very effective. Okay, Pat, did you have? Yeah, I just wanted to add that. As far as success stories goes, I think the National Weather Service has done a really good job of um, making a system that is both standardized and centralized. Um, whereas, you know, if I'm getting a particular type of warning, um, it doesn't matter what area of the country I'm in, it looks exactly the same as the other area of the country. Um, so making any, any information that's available, making it as standardized as possible and as centralized as possible to access, I think would, would be very beneficial. Okay. okay, well, thank you all. Uh, I think we can go to uh, audience questions if there are any. I think we have one, somebody in the back. Oh. Is this one? Huh? So I guess a two-part question. One, I guess, on the standard development side, for those of you that try to make sure it's all universal so we don't get all those phone calls saying, <laughs> why does mine look different? Um, now that we've learned some stuff on, on the Spanish language side, I'm curious on the, on, on the technology uh, moving forward. Obviously, you have to do that incrementally, but um, out of the lessons learned, does that help in the development of next, uh, of, of another language that, that might be tackled? Or is it really a big focus on, on the language and the uniqueness itself? And then for the folks that uh, uh, sort of uh, going a little bit on, on, on what y'all are doing with New York on, on, on those, on those multi 15 different languages, one of the things there's a discussion among emergency managers of how do we 
increase the number of platforms automatically? How do we go from just what we're doing now to um, to gaming systems or, or satellite radio, those kinds of things where you might be able to push alerts? Um, can you give me a sense of any discussions that's gone of how multi-language might go there as well? Or are we forecasting we'll go that way in English first and multi-language will, will continue to trail along or any of this progress, how, how that dovetails into, into future expansion of platforms. Let me start. Uh, yeah, so for wireless emergency alerts, when we added Spanish in, um, what it required on the cell broadcast channel is to add a, a set of message IDs for the Spanish information. Um, that's something that has been part of the, the underlying cell broadcast standard. And um, so this was a, a learning experience. How do we integrate that in with wireless emergency alerts and provide the necessary filtering on the devices? Um, obviously, if we add more languages, uh, we have to add additional message IDs, transfer, transmit the information down to the mobile device, uh, have the device filter uh, properly, and so forth. Um, that part I would call more mechanical, but the real question comes in now is, you know, when I go back to the number of, uh, of, of languages that needed to be support, supported and, and the potential for congestion of those control channels. So that's where we have to really take a close look and understand um, what, what you wanted, because I think you mentioned earlier in your jurisdiction 155 languages. Well, getting that many languages, 360 characters on the control channel, you can see some challenges there. So we need to work together, understand what language is next in the pipe uh, and, and what, what the priority language is for getting in uh, and how many languages and what other tools do we have available like the URL and, and look at all possible uh, ways to support that. Okay. Dovetailing on that for, uh, for broadcast TV and cable TV, uh, we need to bear in mind what's, what's possible today and in, in the real reasonable future in, in terms of supporting a lot of those 155 uh, languages. Uh, so, uh, characters that can use the ASCII font set, uh, for example, can be exported into character generators pretty easily. That rules out Arabic and most, a uh, most Asian languages. Uh, you can't get those out into character generators unless you've got a higher end media keyer, uh, and, or you're going to ask your broadcaster to spend $100,000 to upgrade their plant just to support one language. That's a big ask for a TV station. So uh, there are limitations within the broadcast space in terms of what languages could be supported in the full range of EAS capabilities. That may not exist in ATSC 3.0 next gen TV. That's, and, and I want to be careful in saying, ATSC 3.0, Mass Emergency Information, uh, what the consortium may warn is promoting, is not EAS. It's not a replacement for EAS. It's an information service. Uh, that information service can take in EAS messages, uh, could translate it at the station, take from source and display it. Uh, um, in any number of languages, because it's just like a web browser, as we said. But for EAS, um, for most stations, we're stuck in the realm of Roman characters or ASCII characters. Could could somebody, and we'll get to, just let me have this one because we've but uh, three or four people have talked about EA about ATSC 3.0, and and uh, un unfortunately we didn't have John Lawson wasn't able to be on our panel today. But can somebody just give a pretty succinct? description of, of uh, irrespective of language, but, but what its capabilities are as essentially a, an, an IP-driven broadcast-based functionality. Maybe I'm asking the wrong panel. Well, uh, yeah, of, of ATSC 3.0? Yeah. Okay. Well, well, you we, could do that. Well, yeah, we provided the specification for advanced, so. Okay, so, yeah, so thanks. Guilty as charged. Um, it is an IP-based a messaging capability where the station can relay an XML message uh, that includes multimedia resources to a television receiver, an ATSC through oh, receiver. Over the, over the free over the over air, the air, over the air okay. all pushed out, and the ATSC receiver can display what is sent, uh, get the icon. Uh, if that's a message of interest to you, you click on and obtain more information. Um, that information might be filtered by language. As was said earlier, you can set up your TV if you're a Spanish language household. And, uh, and that message may well have multimedia links out to the internet as well. So it's a kind of a hybrid environment as well where you may well be grabbing information from commercial weather providers, the, weather uh, the, the National Weather Service, or the government themselves in, uh, right onto your TV set. So now your TV set is looking a lot more like one of these smartphones, just right. a lot heavier. 
Right, and, and just in short, the ATSC 3.0 is a, a new broadcast standard. It's not mandatory, it's voluntary, and the industry is, is deploying it in certain pilot programs and in certain areas around the country. Okay, okay, you had a question. Are you? Oh, okay. Uh, my question's real easy, and then this gentleman could go. Uh, it's the same one I asked earlier, basically. I mean, you guys talked about how it's, you know, there are lots of broadcasters that don't use their iPods, that don't uh, adopt some of the technology that's available out there. Would uh, some sort of federal regulation or initiative to to uh, encourage multilingual alerting aid in that? Is that something that you want? I can't speak for the broadcast industry, but uh, those that are here are shaking their heads no. Uh, I, I think the way we've approached ATSC 3.0, just an example, and other initiatives, is to find the value added in this emergency information, these emergency alerts, to make it more useful, more attractive uh, uh, for the audience. Uh, have that make it a value added for the audience, and that's one of the premises behind uh, ATSC 3.0 emergency, inf emergency information. To, to link it to different resources that are actually of value to the audience, to the consumer. Uh, and I'll betray my biases, it's about market-driven solutions, not the heavy hand of government. If things are truly broken, yes, the government should step in. But it's not broken, we're still at the point of encouraging people and letting them discover what's out there. We're not ready for regulation yet. I hope we're never ready for regulation in this space. It's about getting emergency managers, broadcasters, other media participants to understand what their technologies are, what the limitations are, and get them to use them in the best manner for their respective audiences. Yeah, I, I wouldn't think that regulation is the way to go. I think driving the partnership between uh, the private, public-private sector is, is really where you need to go and, and make sure everybody understands what technology it is and you know what the broadcaster's capability is versus what the emergency manager's capability is versus what we will, will drive for them and EAS will drive and, and those. It's, it's making sure everybody's on the same page and is operating on the same sheet of paper. Uh, hello, uh, so going back to some of the standards issues, oh, Sean Donlin, going back to some of the standards issues, the advantage of, of multilingual is it's a global issue and the rest of the world is already working on the standards. Um, your iPhone and Android are already global devices. They handle Korean, Chinese, Arabic, whatever language, character set you pump into it, uh, they'll pump out because they sell in all those countries already. Uh, the challenge is the U.S. standards tend to focus only on English. So you can buy global television character generators, but uh, U.S. Broadcasters usually just buy the, the cheapest, which might just be ASCII. But uh, um, a lot of the, the WIA 2.0 delays, I think, were more about uh, oddball FCC um, additions that the rest of the world didn't need. So they had to go back and put those in. Um, as you said, uh, the Android and the iPhone were already supporting Spanish. Uh, they already had the the characters in there, um, but uh, needed to add the extra stuff um, that was needed. Um, not about multilingual, but there was a whole bunch of other things in that rulemaking. Um, so my point was, is the U.S. going to leverage the stuff that South Korea, Japan, and the rest of the world is doing in multilingual, or is it still going to be English first? that question to folks in the industry, I think, at this point. Um, to anybody? ATSC, I'm, I'm, on, I'm the uh, vice chair of the ATSC implementation committee uh, for ATSC 3.0. Uh, I can't, I'm not speaking for ATSC, I, I'll just state that ATSC is an international organization. Uh, the standards are, are supportive of multiple languages, uh, multiple approaches, uh, and in this case, it's actually the Koreans uh, Korean went, Korea went to ATSC 3.0 uh, live uh, first, uh, before we even got our pilots up. But they're, they're going back and taking our, uh, uh, what we've learned already about AEA, Advanced Emergency Information, and bringing that back into the uh, Korean marketplace. So it, it is more of a dynamic 
uh, for IP-based technologies, there's more of a dynamic dis discussion. Um, EAS, though, is, well, quite frankly, it's a 1970s era technology deployed in the 1990s uh, that is really organized around one language and around ASCII, around lower Roman, uh, Roman characters. That's, that's just the way it is, um, unless we revise the EAS protocol. I'm not advocating we do, but each system has its limitations. IPOS cap, when it goes into the cloud and can handle uh, UTF characters, can, can support any number of, of, of languages in the right cap. But once it gets to the station, or once it gets transmitted, converted into EAS, you lose all that richness and it's EAS only. That's one of the reasons we implemented trigger cap polling. Once we get that EAS message, we'll go back to IPOS and say, is there something better here we can use automatically? Uh, Brian, let, me, let, let me just talk about WIA uh, for a moment. Uh, WIA is built upon the global public warning system standard as defined in, in 3GPP, and the underlying technology is cell broadcast, which has been around you know, for quite some time within the GSM family of technologies. So uh, we are using globally harmonized standards uh, to support wireless emergency alerts. Now, when you mention multiple languages, um, the issue is getting the content broadcast out to the mobile device in those multi-languages. And that's where I was talking about the, you know, the, the addition of Spanish uh, required the new message identifier with the Spanish content. Uh, the content doesn't come in the device. The content has to come from the alert originators. Uh, we just broadcast it out using those global standards. So even though devices may be global and support you know, uh, different character sets and so forth, uh, without that content being broadcast down to the device, um, it, you, you're not going to be able to take advantage of that. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, the panel has so far talked about market-driven solutions and not necessarily uh, the need for regulations, but how do you think the federal government can support uh, multilingual translations in addition to uh, the upcoming WIA 2.0? Are there any other ways the federal government can support this? So we have FEMA represented, National Weather Service, FCC, and even um, not federal, but the, the carriers as well. Is there anything that the big, bigger organizations can do uh, to support this capability? Uh, CISRIC has commented on this a, a couple of times where they were specifically sort of asked that question uh, by the FCC. And I think the answer was there's enough stuff in place now. There's enough sort of toys in the toy box stand back, let people try and fit them together, see what looks pretty when you build it, see what people want. That's market driven, but after all, they spend money on something that people actually want. Uh, stand back and see what we come up with. It's too soon, I think, for government regulation to say, concentrate on this or do only that, or you must do such and such. Uh, the push is there to say, pay attention to multilingual. Multilingual is important. Uh, here are some tools, let's do it. How do we get people to use what's there? As far as uh, making rule sets now uh, via lawyers, I, I think it's too soon. If, if that time ever comes, but now isn't the time. Yeah, and, and just let me just add one thing. Uh, and, and this is just Greg, I'm not speaking for the commission, obviously. Um, it's what this workshop's about. I mean, the whole point of this workshop is to, is, to, is to educate local, municipal, state government about the resources that are available. And I think one of the things you're seeing here today is, is, is how much is available, how much space there is for cooperation and, and collaboration and, uh, and, and, and moving this ball forward. And, and the other thing that I would mentioned in the, in the first panel is that uh, we have an advisory committee, the Intergovernmental Advisory Committee, that's been tasked with coming up with best practices and guidelines, essentially guidance, guidance for the commission to deliver to, to, to exactly the governmental entities that you're talking about. So that, that I say, is, 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 is an equally important role as, as any kind of rulemaking, and there's a lot of potential there, given what we've learned today, I think. Well, just to add something, too, I think what we have to look at in general, um, you know, and, and speaking from my perspective with what we do, is, you know, we're, we're in a day and age where we're seeing robocalls being just tremendous out the board, right? And we're a company that sends that type of message out, but it's an emergency type message. I think, you know, one of the challenges we're seeing from our government customers is, you know, 
we're not going to rely on one specific way of sending messages out because we have to rely on every way we po possibly can. Uh, but we also want to make sure we're not preventing the government agencies from sending out messages. So when we start seeing messages come in as spam because of you know which whichever way it's been regulated to say it's not deemed an important message, that you know there's a, a there's an un nerving feeling around, around the emergency management community that I may send out emergency messages that nobody's going to get, you know, because there's, there's too many blocking devices, there's too many ways to say, you know, just because this came out in mass volume, it's not a message of importance. So there are some steps that we have to take as a community in this, this type of room here with the cell carriers, with the FCC, with the uh, different regulations that are in place to make sure that emergency messages truly have emergency meaning behind them, that they're not being prevented from getting to their final destination. Um, that's extremely important going forward, that we're not preventing our emergency managers from getting their job done. Ed. Um, going back to the original question, uh, what can our federal partners do to enhance the uptake of multilingual. Uh, from the FCC, workshops like these are great. Don't regulate. <laughs> um, from FEMA, maybe some of the same answer. Um, continued outreach and, and, and education of emergency managers and broadcasters, for that matter, what the technologies can do today. That would be helpful. Uh, priming the pump. Um, unfortunately, I don't think our colleague from the National Weather Service is here. Um, priming the hump, pump would be uh, when the National Web Service can inject cap messages into FEMA IPAWS, and they're not yet for, for EAS for various technical reasons. It would be phenomenal if the National Weather Service could also develop a bilingual capability for those messages. Uh, National Weather Service, if they began sending bilingual cap messages for weather alerts into IPAWS, not just WEA, but for EAS, that may be a game changer in terms of the community understanding among broadcasters, cable operators, and emergency managers on what the system can do. So I'll put the ball kind of in their court. Okay. Well, I think that uh, is going to wrap it up. And um, I guess before we do that, uh, we, I would just say a few words that it's been real promising to. Um, hear all this, uh, all, all the testimony, if you will, from all the folks here. Um, some of the takeaways, to me uh, at least, is that, and especially if you're a, a local or state emergency manager out there watching this, is that there's stuff that you can do. Um, you know, there, there's technologies available to you right now, and, and there's a, a, a large group of folks that want to work with you. So if working with your uh, local broadcasters and, and broadcaster associations and, and, and cable associations, uh, work with these guys to try and uh, come up with solutions that work in your jurisdictions. And then uh, and identify the, the folks that, that you want to get uh, uh, alerting to in, in their languages. Uh, and then beyond that, um, there's lots of technologies available today, and there's lots of new and exciting things coming on down the road. So to me, uh, the big takeaway is that you know multilingual still has a long way to go, and we're not there yet. But there's things that you can do right now. And I think we would encourage folks to, uh, to, to do that. And, and, and if you're out there watching this and you're, and you're not sure what to do and you, you need help, you can contact us here at the FCC, and obviously you can contact any of these guys. And um, <clears throat> we'll help you off. And you can, uh, Al Kenyon tells me that it's okay to contact him too. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and we're happy to help you and, and, um, and, and help you uh, get the ball rolling on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. This is a great, this is a great day. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you all. And thanks to the panel.